Hey, it's Herbert. Mm-hmm. And you're listening to the About Last Night podcast, you slippery little son of a bitch. <laughs> oh, it's comedy in your ears, which we all love. Mm-hmm. You're listening to the About Last Night podcast with my boy, uh, Adam Ray. Yes. Hey, Whoa. What's up, Whoa. Riz with, oh, the, with the off-season pandemic goatee. Exactly. First couple of weeks, I had the beard. I looked like Ernest Hemingway, so I went with George Clooney. <laughs> George Clooney. <laughs> yeah. People don't know this about Rick Riz. He models a lot of his life choices after George Clooney. Exactly. I wish <laughs> I had a, a house in Como, Italy. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, with that, with that attitude, it might... Uh, it might happen someday. Riz, how is your, I love your, your backdrop. This is one of my favorite things about doing these Zoom um, conferences. Like, look, you have a great, like, looks like a real nice fridge. You got some cool ass magnets. You got the M's <laughs> flag up. And I've got like hiding in the corner a bottle of Tums. Tums too. <laughs> Clearly that should let you where I'm at in my life. Um, yeah, but you have a nice balance, though. You know, yeah. Uh, like the curtains, you know, hey, that's what life is all about. A good balance. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how have you... Uh, it was nice to talk to you, uh, I think now a week ago on the drive yeah. down to Oregon when the uh, I shot you a text that the uh, one game playoff was on and then you uh, gave me a call. And it was so great because, you know, I don't know if you've always <laughs> been this way. You go right into you have an amazing ability to remember, reminisce, detail. I think it's one of the things we first bonded over when I met you at um, Vino Bella's in Issaquah. Uh, after after my show, and I just see you over there, and I'm like, holy shit, that's Rick Riz, <laughs> one of my childhood heroes. I think if he was here seeing my show, I think I can approach him. I was wearing a Mariners hat. I looked you over, were. and you gave me a thumbs up. So I was like, okay, I think now I have jurisdiction to fan out. And you just see me do my thing, and I wasn't too terrible, so there was enough – you know, I had you a little great. bit – Oh, good, okay. Yeah, I was, fishing for, a, I was fishing for a compliment, and I fucking hooked you. Oh, no, you, no, you were <laughs> outstanding. But, uh, but you, uh, you really – I think – you know, somewhat appreciated my ability to, when we start talking baseball, remember like, you know, Henry Cotto stats or when <laughs> Kevin Mitchell and Dave Fleming joined the mayor, you know what I'm saying? Like things like that, that you, I feel like just have a part of your brain. And maybe this is what makes a, a great commentator. One of the many things, but have you always been that way? Because as soon as I brought up the M's game on the radio, you started uh, rattling off the time, the weather, the the pitching matchup. <laughs> and I was like, maybe I should just turn the radio down. And you can take over. <laughs> but I don't know what it is, that? Adam. I think it's just that certain things stand out in your mind. They're, they're so relevant at the time and so interesting, so much fun. And then you talk about it again and again and again, like that one game playoff, the 1995 season. I lived that year over time and time again, especially game five where Edgar hits the double. Right. So it's just ingrained in you. You know, it's like you with all your jokes or learning lines in the wonderful movie that you were in, a couple of movies, you know, but I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. But the, the important things, you know, like like your career, uh, great games in Mariners history, uh, you know, those things just, just stand out. And they'll, I think they'll, I hope <laughs> they'll always be there. And if somebody jogs your memory like you did the other day, then you remember, remember that one game playoff, Randy Johnson against Mark Langston. Right. And how, you know, the Mariners went out and got Randy some runs and then he gave up a run in the top of the ninth inning. But that was all that they were going to get. But it was a great matchup. Langston traded away to the Expos for Randy Johnson, you know, and Brian Holman and Gene Harris. And Gene Harris was the key to the deal. He's the only one that didn't pan out, you know. Wow. But, uh, you know, you just you just remember stuff like that that uh, matter to you. And to the fans, you know, here in the Pacific Northwest, because without that one game playoff win, there's no American League Series. Yeah, we're gone. I'm talking to you from your your beach uh, lake front house in Tampa, probably. 
And exactly. There's no Edgar Martinez, two home runs, grand slam, seven RBIs in game oh. four. There's no Randy Johnson winning game three. There's no Edgar double in game five. Junior coming back in August, uh, you know, of that year. So there's no uh, Jacob Groshong's family giving me tickets to game six or seven of the ALCS for my bar mitzvah and me wrongfully choosing to go to game seven because I thought Randy would lock in game six. There's none of that. Jacob, yeah, <laughs> Jacob, way to go, Jacob. You know, good job, buddy. You know, yeah, there's none of that. <laughs> Are the anyway, things like that, you know, you remember. Do you also remember, because here's one thing as a fan that will never truly get, because look, you getting to go to every game, I, I'm always curious, does the monotony of the ambiance start to kind of creep in or, uh, or is every day so exciting when you're also from your booth and your vantage point and getting to watch it and call it, I mean, like, you've been so cool to let me come up to the booth. What a call, Rick. What a call! That was awesome. Riz, you're the freaking man. <laughs> and it's the best seat in the house. Yeah. Truly. And, and, I mean, as it should be. But does it ever get, uh, I guess, like, do you ever just sit down and go, oh, yeah. man, all right, I got to dig deep for this game. No. Uh, first of all, I don't know how the guards, the little lady guards let you in, but they did. <laughs> yeah. but anyway, well, I'm strong. I just muscle right Irma, by you know? <laughs> Yeah, they're yeah. the sweetest little things, but the if best. they don't know you, man, they they are they will oh, body slam. They were you. just like, How do you know Rick Ritt? Like, what's his and favorite then, ice cream flavor? I, like, I don't <laughs> think he's eating ice cream these days. Look at his body figure. Butter pecan. <laughs> <laughs> just in case they ask, it's butter yeah. pecan. Okay, good to know. But anyway, no, you know, I, I never never worry about uh, you know, tomorrow. It's it's always about that game and and out of the thousands of games that I've done in 45 years, eight years. Adam in the minor leagues and 38th year coming up in the big leagues, 35th wow. with the Mariners, three wow. in the between with the Tigers. They're all they're all different. They really are. You know, there's nine innings to a ball game. Sometimes it gets longer, 10, 11, 12, 19 innings against the Boston Red Sox and Mike Cameron hitting a home run in the bottom of the 19th inning to beat Jeff Facero and the Boston Red Sox. So in a way, they're all different. When you when you go out to a ball game, it is. I just saw Forrest Gump the other night. So baseball is like a box of chocolates. You yeah. never know what you're going to get, and and <laughs> you really dump. don't. You don't. You don't know if Felix Hernandez on August the fifteenth of two thousand and twelve is going to throw not only a, a a no hitter but a perfect game. Yeah. You don't. You don't know that. You don't know if the same year. You know, six pitchers go out there for the Mariners against the Los Angeles Dodgers and throw a combined six-pitcher no-hitter. Yeah. Kevin Milwood had to leave with a groin injury after six innings. Uh, you don't know that Edgar's going to hit that double. You don't know that you Mike know. Cameron's going to hit four home runs in a game at Comiskey, right? There you go against I mean, the Chicago Whites. And his fifth time up, well, sixth time up because he walked his fifth time up. You don't know in that last at bat. That ball almost went out to right field. If he pulls that ball, it's five home runs. Has that ever been done? Yeah. Oh, no. No, it's never been done. Four home runs, you know, tied the record by Jim Gentile and a couple of other guys. But, yeah, Adam, you don't, you, you don't know what you're going to get. I imagine in, in your field, too, yeah. every night is a little bit different in front of a crowd because totally. of the crowd, because of the feel and everything like that. You feel pumped up. And sometimes maybe you're not as pumped up as other nights, but you just, you just get that adrenaline and you get going again, and then you can't wait to get there again. So I'm, I'm living my dream. I've been wanting to do this, Adam, since I was 12 years old. So – Every day is a treat going out to the ballpark after 45 years. It's a great analogy, by the way, because comedy is very comparable in that the audience, you know, it's different. You're getting a, a whole new set. I mean, look, there's yeah. a lot of season ticket holders and people that come back, but what, uh, how, how, what does T-Mobile hold? Uh, 46,000. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of new faces every night. And, and, and like in standup, you're getting a new set of strangers to try to entertain and connect with and, yeah. And you trust that what you've done and what you do is, is going to do that. But, like, again, you don't know if the crowd one night is going to give you a standing O because you've been pouring it. And, and you feed off that energy. And I would assume that it is yeah. uh, the same with, uh, with uh, announcing baseball games because, look, that one game playoff, and I wanted to ask you this, I mean, listening to the radio, you and Dave were I, – I watched games, but with the uh, sound off and you guys on the radio. And I'm sure a lot of people – did that and yeah. and then a lot of times I would just go radio because there was something extra special about letting your imagination and the way you guys painted the pictures and listening to it 
especially in that 95 season when the crowds were, I mean, you could hear through the radio. It was so loud. Sometimes you couldn't hear you guys. And it was yeah. really cool, A, because we'd never seen or felt that before, and B, because it was just, uh, a as a kid to be, you know, you always heard about listening and seeing in movies, listening to games on the radio. So to actually do that yeah. and have a tandem like you and Niehaus to, to bring that to our ears was, was awesome. But was it as, like, you can't match that energy in the play. That one-game playoff was 68,000. We hadn't seen a sold-out game, game in the kingdom. I don't think, maybe opening day, right? And then I don't even know if those, if those were sold out. No, like opening day, my first year was 83, 1983. That was six okay. years after the start of the franchise. We had 37,000 fans there. We played the Yankees, won the game five to four. Gaylord Perry against Ryan Guidry. Richie Zisk get a home run to the bottom of the third. I called it. Dave went, oh, you called the first home run of the year. We didn't score many runs that year. We didn't, didn't <laughs> yeah. win many games that year, 102 yeah. losses. But it was one of the greatest years of my life after spending eight years in the minor leagues. But, uh, you know, you, you just get so – you fired up about each each and every ball game and uh you know that that pitcher changes everything if he has a great night you got a great chance to win when you go on on stage if you're pumped up you know you're gonna have a great night you got a chance to you know knock over the fans uh so I, you know it's just something that's really really special every time you you go out to the ballpark and you just gave us thank you uh one of the greatest compliments you could possibly give uh to a radio announcer and that's the feel and see the game, you know, on the radio. And every night when I say goodbye, when I finish at the end of the game, I'll say, I always say, we'll see you on the radio tomorrow night. And one person went, what do you mean you see you on the radio? I said, and if we choose our words the right way, and Dave Niehaus was the greatest at that, who's in the Hall of Fame, you know, we, we want you to see the game on the radio. We want you to see that green monster at Fenway Park in Boston. If I can put you in the front row at Fenway at Yankee Stadium at T-Mobile Park or the old days, the Kingdom then I'm doing my job. So I think that's the greatest compliment you can give to a radio announcer to turn on down the sound on the TV. Oh, yeah. Listen to the radio. We'll give you a lot of information, but this is the greatest camera ever invented. It's your imagination, you know, and if you can picture the game as we describe it, uh, you know, then uh, that's the greatest compliment that you could possibly give us, buddy. Does it raise your uh, your game too? Like when you walked into the the dome that uh, oh, yeah. that Sunday night uh, or su yeah Sunday afternoon, I guess. Did you yeah. just uh, right away? Were you your excitement level? You feel like a little kid, right? And then are you and yeah. Dave just like this is going to be a good one? Like bump it out? Like yeah. how, what's the pregame? What is the energy like in the dome that day? I just want to know because it seems to me the craziest game that we've ever had, fan wise. Adam, let me tell you, it starts from the time you wake up. You can't wow. you can't you can't go to sleep at night the night before. You can't wake up. It's like Christmas Eve when you're five years old and you can't wait to get up and, and get down there and, and open up the presents from Santa Claus and everything like that. You can't wait to the next day. Santa who? So I'm sorry. We had Hanukkah. <laughs> we didn't have any mascots. I've heard about this guy, but what does he do? Santa Claus, big old jolly uh, <laughs> yeah. elf. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah, there Brings we go. Brings presents on Christmas Eve, yeah, breaks up your house every night, leaves gifts. <laughs> I think I saw him at Alderwood Mall once, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah He's guy. a friendly guy, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. He's always at the mall. Yeah, he but, loves it. But, uh, yeah, you, you know, you, you – you walk into the kingdom and, and it's just, the place is just going crazy. You know that Randy Johnson is going to pitch. You, you know that you're going to win. It, it was amazing because right before that, Adam, you know, we're down in Texas. We had two games left in the regular season. That was 1995. Now that was a strike shortened year. We didn't yeah. start the season until April 26th, I believe, because the guys finally came back. We had a few weeks of spring training. Instead of opening April, early April, we opened up April 26th. So now it's at the end of the year. We just need to win one more game down in Texas and end up losing. Mickey Tettleton had a great game for the Rangers. Then we got to fly all the way back home. But we were excited. They knew that they were going to win. Randy Johnson was going. He wasn't going to be denied. And sure enough, he pitched that great game against uh, Mark Langston. But you walk into the kingdom, and uh, even with nobody there, you start to feel the little hairs in the back of your neck, you know, get excited. Uh, and, you know, Lou Pinella is your manager. There's no way he's going to let this one slip away. He's fired up, you know, more than anybody. And then the fans start to come in, and Dave and I and Kevin Kremen were getting ready for the ball game. And we know, you know, the weight, the impact, uh, what this game is going to mean for the mean for the franchise because we were fighting for our lives. Oh, yeah. You know, to stay in Seattle. People don't know that, that it was on the ballot to, well, the, the, you know, the Mariners, they were trying to get uh, money for a new stadium, right? Right. 
There was and, a, there was a, a vote on September the seventeenth of that year. We're playing the Texas Rangers, and that was a night where Doug Strange, you know, it was a refuse to lose. Everybody was a hero. Everybody was star at different night. Hits a home run off of Jeff Russell. But there was the vote that night for the one tenth of one percent sales tax to build the new ballpark. Well, the vote was coming in. It was real favorable. Then at the end of the ball game, it was still looking good. But then votes came in, I think, from Eastern Washington and absentee votes came in. And uh, we ended up losing by a thousand uh, votes. But Mike Lowry, the governor of the state of Washington at the time, said, we, we can't let this ball club go. So he put together wow. uh, with the legislature, you know, uh, a car rental sales tax. He put together the restaurant and bar uh, sales tax and the Mile My Lottery. And with those three entities, Adam, we were able to fund enough money to go, held, go ahead and build the new ballpark. And we got Safeco Field, which is now T-Mobile Park. Right. But if it wasn't for those three entities, we wouldn't have had enough money because uh, Slade Gordon, who was the attorney general, the United States senator uh, at the time, and then um, he, he saved baseball more than one occasion. He told me long after the vote, he said, Rick, it was a blessing in disguise that it failed because had that one-tenth of one percent sales tax passed in September of 1995, it wouldn't have generated enough money. But the other three things did oh, to good. build eventually to Mobile Park, the best ballpark yeah. in baseball. But anyway, back to your question, yeah. you know, Dave and I sit down and Kevin, and we know the weight and the significance of this ball game. And you know, Randy Johnson is going to be Randy Johnson. And it was just so exciting. Everyone's screaming from the get-go, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, I had to push my earphones in like this so, so I could hear. It was so loud in the kingdom. They refused to lose all year long. If you recall, we were 13 games out of first place on August the 1st. With two and a half months to go? With two months to go. Two months to with go, two yeah. months to go. And, and we had to make up a 13-game difference. And that was the third largest comeback in the history of baseball. The California Angels kept losing. We kept winning. Oh, yeah. Junior came. Yeah. That's what people don't uh, truly understand is that not only do we have to go on a run, the team that was red hot all year had to miraculously drop, which, yeah. I mean, happens in baseball, which is why the sport is, is so Beautiful. incredible because the ups and downs of it and the getting hot at the right time mattering. But for them yeah. to drop and – us and and guys like Vince Coleman hitting grand slams. I mean, it was uh, it was it was captivating. I felt like I was at the right age. I was in seventh uh, grade in '95, which is like prime time to be a baseball. I was a player. senior in high school. <laughs> I know <laughs> it was crazy that you got the job, uh, <laughs> but it was uh, my friend. My friends and I we used to take the bus down from Lake Forest Park, Albertsons. All the way, myself, Adam French, Chris DeLeon, Jonathan Stevens, all the way down to the kingdom. We would buy uh, at Albertsons first a uh, construction uh, paper, a big piece of cardboard or construction paper, and write signs. Because our goal every time we went to a game was to get on Diamond Vision. And uh, we <laughs> got on, I'd say about 80% of the time. Rob Ducey, when we had Rob Ducey, he came up to yeah. get jiggy with it. So we just <clears> made a sign that said, get and Ducey with it. And just held it up. <laughs> little, I mean, second inning, camera guy just boom. He's like, dude, these kids got nothing going on, so let's make their week. And uh, but the the energy was so bonkers, and obviously you guys uh, fed off that. Was it? Oh, yeah. uh, could you tell in spring training? You know, we got to have a cool spring training experience going to Suns games, and and you were so cool again, getting us tickets, and my dad and and some buddies. And spring training to me seems like a time where you can really get a sense of, uh, you know, where the ball club is at. But I also am always curious, like, is it so early, though, that you can't yeah. really gauge or predict? People love in all sports to be like, who's going to win the World Series this year? It's like, dude, it's, it's nobody knows, right? But where, when no. you're at spring training, what is the overall vibe? Is it just all fun? Yeah, uh, well, at the, at the spring training of that particular year, yeah. You know, like I said, we had to wait and wait and wait and wait. And then the guys came back. You know, the guys were really – they put at, – at the end of 94, the strike hit on August the 12th, uh, the guys were playing really well. They went on the road and they were winning ball games. They had the best player in the game of baseball in Ken Griffey Jr. They had a heck of a lineup. They had solid pitching. So uh, at spring training of that year, we finally get going underway. And you're, you're never really sure what type of uh, club you're going to have. You know you got the talent is there, but 
uh, the key factor is can you stay healthy through the spring? Can you stay Huge. healthy through the season? We didn't. Junior got hurt, but everybody picked up the slack. But I'll never forget, uh, Adam, uh, Dave Niehaus did a pregame show interview, as we do every day at spring training and during the regular season with Lou Pinella. And he asked Lou Pinella, Lou, who's the best team in the American League West? And Lou said the Texas Rangers. So anyway, Kevin wow. Kremen had to edit that out. <laughs> he took that out of the interview. Yeah. Yeah. Lou, come no. on. Nobody heard that. Lou, yeah. you're supposed to say we are. You <laughs> yeah, know? Yeah. But I love Lou Pinella. I love him. He's unbelievable. He willed us to win. He taught us how to win. <clears throat> and he was a major force in, in putting that team together and showing us how, you know, how to win ball games because, you know, he was American League Rookie of the Year, went to the Yankees, was a very good player with the New York Yankees, played uh, under Billy Martin, who played under Casey Stangl. So he had that hard-nosed edge and everything, just wanted to win. So, uh, you know, you really don't know at spring training. A lot of things have to go right. Uh, and, and when Junior went down on May 26, after slamming into the wall in right center field of the Kingdom, chasing down a fly ball by Kevin Bass of Baltimore, we just, our hearts sunk because, man, we knew he was hurt. And uh, he was gone for three months. He broke his wrist, shattered his wrist. They put a plate in his wrist with seven screws to keep it in. Did you and know they, he, was, he was badly hurt right when he hit the wall? He, Right when he hit the wall, no. When he came off the field, yes. Because, you know, just the look in his eye, he was looking up like he knew he was really hurt. And if you look at that video, you know, he hits the wall with both hands, and his left hand goes in between uh, the padding. Oh, and there's man. sections of padding. And right behind that is just a hard wall. So his hand hit that hard wall behind the padding. just punched that concrete. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And his hand crumpled like that, broke the wrist. Yeah, I remember Dave, all... Dave saying, uh, and Junior's hurt. Like he said, and the way he said it when he was holding his wrist, it was like, oh, yeah. no. Which yeah. is, you never think about, you know, Junior was just a larger-than-life player and seemed like not even real. Um, I know from a fan perspective, you know, I knew, what's crazy to me is, you know, looking back, I go, God, thank heavens I grew up in Seattle during that time, it's, it's how people feel about watching Michael Jordan. You know, I have friends in Chicago or from Chicago that are like, dude, I went to games. And look, they were super popular, so it was tougher to get a ticket to a Bulls game, and they were good. But even in the early days, you knew what you were watching. And for yeah. as a kid to even have that uh, wherewithal to be like, I know that this is special, that I get to come down here on a school night and watch this. And every game was exciting because you didn't know – even if it was a catch or even to see him just chase down a yeah. ball. 28 stolen bases. High fly ball, well tagged this time, and Junior going back to the track. The wall makes the leap and makes the catch. Amazing catch by Junior as he takes a home run away from Luis Gonzalez. My, oh my. Perfect timing, and Junior receiving a standing ovation here. Or, or, uh, maybe hit a home run so if that's what it's like for a fan I mean what was it like for you you and Dave I was just amazing watching him play every day uh you know he could beat you in so many ways and uh, he just had fun doing it you know he had all the ability in the world he was the greatest player I've ever seen and uh, honestly and you know so he had the great speed he had the ability to you know, run like a gazelle and, and catch balls over the wall and take away home runs and hit home runs and things like that. I'll, I'll never forget a conversation I had with him early in the season. We were in Chicago in the clubhouse. And uh, one thing he didn't do was steal a lot of bases. Thank goodness. He, he wasn't the greatest base steal slider. You know, we he don't scared want that the hell him. out of me because yeah. he slid late all the time. But early in the season, a couple of days in the season, he had like three stolen bases and he was at the top of the list of the league leaders. I said, Judy, look at this. You're leading the league in stolen bases. But I told him, uh, you know, I said, you're going to lead the league in home runs. You're going to do it. He said, nah, I'm not a home run hitter. I hit line drives. I said, Junior, your line drives go out of the ballpark. Junior, a high fly ball, belted, number 20. That is fly away. Ken Griffey Jr., deep right center field. Now has 54 RBIs. My, oh, my, what a shot by Junior on that 2-2 pitch. You know, he had 630 home runs, and he missed 
about so much time. He was hurt with the Cincinnati Reds for the longest time, even with us. You know, he missed that time shattering his wrist. And I think it was like 282 games I heard or something. I mean, it was. Oh, I, I added it up. He lost about four seasons, you know, on the disabled. That's insane. Yeah, yeah. And he still hit 630 home runs. First battle Hall of Famer. Only Steroid three guys. Free. Only three guys didn't vote for him, and they found out who they were, Adam. Mo, Larry, and Curly. So, <laughs> yeah, I was like, you're not going to say that's that. That's the only man. joke I got for you, buddy. You, you're, you're the jokester. By the way. Only three guys didn't vote for him. Yeah, that was anyway, some bullshit. Me, yeah, I mean, yeah. the amount of Seattle people that were like, oh, what is going on in your life that you have to take it out on? I mean, it's so unanimous. Yeah. And when it's you that, you got to vote for Junior. I mean, it's, you know, you get in, you get in, but like – to be three away it's like maybe i i just in my head i'm like maybe at some point like he saw junior at like a at a costco and he like said hey <laughs> hey will you do a quick video for me where i throw like a baguette and you chase it down and catch it and dive dive into the into the, the cakes and the donuts and catch it and then run back and then hold yeah. it up and say hey i love <laughs> danny's baguettes and you can give my baguette store some free press Maybe that happened, and Junior said, "Man, I'm with my family." And the guy goes, "Well, then, fuck you, man." Yeah. That was it. Maybe he was like, Ooh, "You know you what?" Can say that on a podcast, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll never forget one time uh, we played, and the guys weren't real happy about this. So in 1997, we started off a two-week road trip with an exhibition game in Zebulon, North Carolina, uh, my minor league ballpark. We, it's somewhere in North Carolina. Yeah. Where there's a and field, we, there's a field. Yeah, and we played uh, – was a minor league ballpark. They were in the Southern League, and we played the Southern League All-Stars in an exhibition game. And that's, this is at the start of a long two-week road trip, so the guys weren't too happy. So, uh, of course, the starters played, like, the first two innings, and then they were out of there, and the, the other guys had a chance to play. And it was a fun game. Uh, and so, anyway, after Junior left the ball game in about the second inning, he walked down the right field line. And while he was on the field and the game was still going on, he stood there, I'm telling you, Adam, for about 45 minutes and signed autographs, one after another, one after another. It was just a mob of fans in that right field corner. Most of the fans weren't watching the game. They wanted to get an autograph from Junior. So he signed for the longest time. Wow. And then he left. You know, he had to leave. The game was going. I went to the clubhouse. And after the game, I saw uh, Junior in the clubhouse. He was really upset. And then uh, I get on the plane. He comes on the plane. He was still upset. I said, Junior, all right? He said, no. I said, what's the matter? Sit down. He said, uh, did you see what I did? I said, yeah, Junior, you were awesome, man. You were down that right field line for the longest time signing autographs. He said, yeah, but one guy said this because I couldn't sign all the autographs, and he said something to me. I said, Junior, don't let that one guy get to you. You know how many people you made happy down there by signing as many autographs as you did as long as you were down there? Don't let that one guy get to you. So uh, wow. I think he finally realized that you just you, That's awesome, you can't make everybody happy. You just can't. But he was down there forever signing autographs. He's a real sensitive guy. He loves kids. He'll, he'll do anything for kids and a lot of people. I just love the kid to death. You still told me that. Kid. You told me that in, in uh, you still call him the kid? Yeah. Yeah. You told me that when we were going to the Suns game, uh, me and my buddies, that you were like people, we were just, you know, talking baseball and talking Griff and, and, uh, and you were like, a lot of people don't know, and he doesn't go out of his way to do it, but know how much he does for charities, how much he does for kids. I think the amount of make-a-wish things he was doing, the amount, oh. I think it was every game you were saying, he was bringing some kid to watch BP and giving well, them, I mean, oh, go ahead. No, 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 you're right. Yeah, I'll it's my show. Let me finish this. Yeah. So, so then, uh, and then, no, no, but you just were really enlightening us to the idea that Griffey did all this stuff without wanting the credit, but knew, recognized that his fame – and, you know, notoriety was at a level to where it's like, dude, bringing a kid or kids or whoever, looking at a kid. I remember when he just yeah. looked at me and talked to me through the batting cage fence at spring training in 95 because my dad lived yeah. in AZ. And I, my uh, brother and I were sitting there and talking to him, and he just made a little small talk with us. Riz, I'll never forget that. So, yes. But he did it on, on a nightly basis, you told me. He really did. He did so many things for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And, of course, the foundation is there and everything. And, and he would do that, oh, I don't know how many times in the course of the year, year after year after year. But this one particular night, it wasn't a Make-A-Wish kid, but a, a friend of mine has had a friend whose uh, son had this uh, serious illness and wasn't going to make it. He was, he was uh, told he was going to live only, I'm not kidding you, two more months to go. Oh. He had really bad cancer. 
And his wish, his hope was to meet Ken Griffey Jr. And I told my friend to tell his mother, I said, come on down to the ballpark. It's at the kingdom. I'll get you down on the field. And that was it. Just get down on the field, maybe say hello to Junior and things like that. So we were down on the field uh, long before batting practice started. His name was Andrew and uh, the, with his mom and dad. And so Junior hadn't come out yet. So I went in the clubhouse and I said, uh, Junior, I, I got a kid out here who's uh, 15 years old. His name is Andrew. I said, he's in really bad shape. And uh, they say he's only got a few months left to live. And I said, would you? He said, bring him in. I said, what, 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 I know you're getting busy. He said, bring him in. So I went back outside and uh, got Andrew. I said, hey, Andrew, come here. Somebody wants to see you. So I, I grabbed Andrew, walked him through the dugout into the clubhouse. And Junior was the only one in the clubhouse sitting in, I called it his throne. He had this black leather massage chair in front of his, uh, Ooh, yeah, in front of his locker. Yeah, he did. And I introduced uh, Andrew to Junior. And, and Andrew just went, and then Junior goes, breathe, Andrew, breathe, you know. <laughs> so I said, Andrew, Ken Griffey Jr., Junior, this is Andrew. And so he said, eh. so he met and he said, uh, you, you play Nintendo? You ever play my game? He says, oh, yeah, all the time. He said, you want to play? So he had, he had it set up in his locker. So they sat down, and I'm not kidding you, Adam. They sat down for about 20 minutes and played his Ken Griffey Jr. game on, on his Nintendo. And so I walk back outside, and I look at his mom and dad. I said, he's, he's inside playing video games with Junior. They were – tears were coming down. Oh, the dress, yeah. you know? So now batting practice is getting ready to start. And Frenchie, uh, Jim Lefevre, our manager, is going, where's Junior? I said, uh, he's inside, Jimmy. And he said, would you go get him? You know, we got to start batting yeah, practice. Yeah. So I went back inside, and there's Junior with Andrew sitting there having a good time. He signed a bat for him. He signed uh, some – he gave him some gloves, and he signed a ball for him. And so he took him outside, and he didn't just drop him off behind home plate with his mom and dad. Like you said, he took Andrew all the way to the batting cage with oh, him. Oh, my God. Yeah. And he stayed there with him, put his arm around him. He, then Junior jumped in, took his cuts, ran around the bases, came back, visited with Andrew, got back in the cage, visited with Andrew. It was unbelievable. He said goodbye to him. I took him up to the radio booth. He was up in the radio booth with me and television. I said goodbye to Andrew. And sure enough, sadly, he passed away in about two months. But that young man had the thrill of his life because of Ken Griffey Jr., what he did that night. It wasn't a make-a-wish thing. But he didn't even let me get the words out of my mouth. He said, bring him in. Bring him in. Damn. And that was, that was Ken Griffey Jr. Besides being the greatest ball player I've ever seen, he had a huge heart. And Man, that's amazing. an incredible – thanks for telling that story, dude. That is – those are the types of things, again, that don't make it into the stat sheet and that don't get the publicity that they should. But, I mean, it's also, again, he's not doing that for that. He's uh, doing it for the kindness heart. of his heart. Yeah, and knowing yeah. that being Griff – I mean – Shit, he had his own candy bar. Had I not been yeah. such a little fat fuck and eaten all the can <laughs> Griffey candy bars that I had, I would have a collector's item right now. But I, I remember when I oh. bought them, too, I put them in the fridge, and I go, hold on to these because they're going to yeah. be worth money someday. An hour later, I'm just like, boy, that did look like some good-ass chocolate. And then <laughs> I do, we do add a new thing of milk, and, I mean, I, mean, I just slammed those things. Oh. There goes the candy bar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think I got more somewhere, somewhere in the closet. What's still, <laughs> I was going to say, do you, are you a collector of baseball memorabilia yourself? Like, do you have, I'm sure you got something from the kingdom when they uh, demolished it. Right. Yeah. My friend, uh, after it was uh, imploded, after we left, uh, a friend gave me some uh, concrete. So I got a, you know, some concrete and a wow. little plastic baggie, but I got some great memories. I've got uh, this sign that was in the owner's booth, the uh, George, Idris was our owner, and uh, he had this sign called uh, Patience is for Losers, and I don't know how I got it, but somebody had it, and I think I bought it or got it at an auction or something like that, or somebody gave it to me, so I, I've got that, but uh, we got some great memories there. You know, it wasn't the greatest ballpark in the world. It was a stadium. It was for tractor pulls, you know, and concerts and football. Football, really, yeah. I played there, too. Yeah. But uh, we made it our home, Adam, in 1995, and we just tore the roof off, and it was it was amazing. When did you meet Dave in '83? So tell me how you got the Adams job. Yeah, 1983, 1982. I'm with the Columbus Clippers, uh, the Yankees AAA Farm Club, in the International League, and I applied for the job. And this is a funny story. If you got time, 
And uh, actually, if you could wrap so, it up in about two minutes, Rick, we're trying to do a no. A, <laughs> yeah, dude, you got time, of course. This is your episode. I don't want to turn this off. So all okay. right, yeah. Okay, so in 1982, uh, it's my eighth year in the minor leagues. I finish up my season with the wow. Columbus Clippers. Real and, quick, is that a long stint in the minors? Like what is a long stint? Eight okay. years. Eight years long. I was in Alexandria, Louisiana, for one year. Amarillo, Texas, for two, with the Padres Farm Clubs. Uh, Memphis, Tennessee, for three, with the Expos double-A teams in the Southern League, and then Columbus with the International League with the Yankees Triple-A Farm Club. Is it similar for your player that you are biding your time to try to get the call to go up? It's it's the same wow. thing. You're, you're trying to move up the ranks, you know. But, however, as a broadcaster, if you're great, if you can go from eight ball to the big leagues, it's all about broadcasting, whereas in baseball you need that rookie A, double-A, triple-A to – have success in each level. Did you ever feel pressure when you were in the minors that you were like, God, I, maybe I just, maybe oh, I don't yeah. have that one catchphrase that people want to stick to. to, to pull me up. <laughs> maybe they're like, dude, Rick Riz just started saying like kaboogie boogans. Like, let's get him up to the <laughs> kaboogie boogans. That's a long shot over the wall. They're like, dude, nobody knows what that means, but his smile and energy when he says it, we got to get that guy yeah. to the kingdom. Like, did you yeah. feel ever, is there that pressure of like, I got to get my sayings or you just kind of hope that yeah. it comes in the flow of the game? No, you hope that it comes in the flow of the game over thousands of games. You hope that you get better and better and better and you understand the game a little bit more and more and more because you, I've worked with great managers, you know, in the minor leagues, Bob Miller, Felipe Alou, Frank Verdi, uh, Larry Bernard, Billy Gardner, wow. uh, you know, and, and guy, Pat Corrales and things like that. And, and the players that you meet along the way, you learn from them, you know, even the ones you play against or, you know, like Cal Ripken Jr. when he was with the Charlotte Orioles. But, uh, you know, you just, you just hope and pray that you finally get an opportunity. And in 1982, I finished my last year, and I applied for the job, and, and they liked my tape. And so – You made a tape um, you know, I'm one, of, like, your calls? I said tape. You know, wow. you send it a resume and tape. So it's your voice. It's it's your your demo reel, basically. It's my demo reel. It's like if yeah. you were a rapper, this would be – which, by the way, people don't know that Riz is actually getting ready to drop a rap album yeah. called uh, Sounds, of, Sounds from the Dome. Uh, well, do you know I, I was I was a rap artist back in 1990. What? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was KPLZ. joking. Yeah, no, Kenton Allen asked. Shout me. out to Kenton Allen. Yeah, we're kind of you're off here, but that's okay. Yeah, I love we'll it. Back. I love we'll it. Back. I love this. They asked me if I would uh, rap a song about Ken Griffey Jr. He can hit this to the MC Hammer song. You know what was that? Can't touch this. You can't touch this. This was he can hit this. And so I, I rapped this song. I went in the studio. You can find it on YouTube. Check it out on YouTube. Rick Riz raps Ken Griffey Jr. song. Oh, my and I, God. And I, I rapped this song that they wrote, and I recorded in their studio, and they had the music and everything. And it was the number one rated song on the radio station for about three weeks. <laughs> yeah. so here's this little Italian dude from the south side of Chicago. I was a rap star for about three weeks here in Seattle. I mean, dear diary, take that. All the old teachers that said, Riz, you'll never be a rapper with a number one song on KPLZ. Yeah, take that. Yeah. <laughs> take that. <laughs> that was your move. Dude, you, your timing, by the way, real quick, and then we'll get back to uh, the minors. You're, when you and Dave went on uh, Almost Live with, uh, I think you did a, a handful of appearances, but there was one that stuck out when you guys would, were with John Keister, I think, right? And yeah. Did, uh, a, uh, I can't remember what the – was it doing calls, right? Yeah, what, what happened was um, it was it was John Keister, but we did this piece with uh, with Bob Nelson. That's right. It was Dave and I were there on stage, and that was a lot of fun. Almost and, Live, for people uh, that don't know, was like SNL for Seattle. And it exactly. played, I think, before or after SNL, but it was amazing. So you guys go on. Yeah, it, it was like in the early 80s, late 70s. You it was know? hot. It was, it was, it was a well-produced show and yeah. so much talent. Bill Nye was on that show. Joe McHale. You know, Pat Cashman and John Keister. Yep. And uh, Nancy Guppy and Tracy. Oh, I forgot her name. Yeah. But anyway, there was a lot of talent on that show. So Dave and I went on, and Bob Nelson played the role of uh, the low-key radio now. <laughs> That's right. So uh, uh, they would play a clip of, of Dave a fly ball, swinging a fly ball, way back to left field, fly, fly away, a home run, get Griffey Jr. And then yeah. Bob Nelson would do it, and he would go, fly ball, gone. 
<laughs> and, and, and then that I would do, they would play a cut of my play by play, swinging the ground ball, seek side by snow, down the right field line to the bullpen. Here comes Blowers, here comes Dino, here comes Joey, throw home, cut up by Langston, and relay home, gets a by Ellis and Chorus scores. Here comes Soho, Soho scores. Everybody scores. And oh Bob Nelson God. would go, ground ball, right field. Everybody scores. And then, uh, but oh my so, god! Uh, so it was it was a it was uh, a funny it was a funny little skit. And then they uh, did the grand slam. Get out the rye bread and mustard. It's grand salami time. And Bob Nelson would go, <laughs> fly ball. Grandma makes a sandwich. <laughs> Here is John Wetland's two-two pitch on the way now to Edgar Martinez. Swung on and belted back to the warning track. Bernie Williams, the wall. Get out the rye bread and the mustard, Grandma. It is Grand Salami time! Unbelievable! Unbelievable! No, I just... It took, you took us right back there again, Dave. Lance, would uh, you show us what you would do, sir? Okay. Edgar batting. It's a good hit. And it's get out that loaf of bread and some meat, Mama. It's uh, time for a big sandwich. Wow! Oh my God! But it was it was a lot of fun. So yeah, we did an episode of uh, Almost Live, and it was it was great. Those those folks, Steve Wilson, was Steve Wilson, great. Joe McHale. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, Joe. It was McHale, also yeah. really cool to have like that crossover because a show that's that popular, you know that the, that the season is uh, turning into something special when now you guys are making appearances like that on really yeah. cool parts of, um, of TV. Okay, so the minors, so you do eight years, and then years. In, in 82, you get a call up? 82, uh, I, I get a call from Melody Tucker. She's the director of broadcasting, Adam, for the Seattle Mariners. And uh, I was at home, and the phone rang, and I thought it was a joke. She goes, I'm Melody Tucker with the Mariners, and you're one of the finalists. I said, how many finalists are there? Yeah. He goes, well, I can't tell you right now, but, uh, you know, we'll let you know what's going on. So anyway, this was at the end of the year, and I didn't hear back for the longest time. And I thought, okay, no opportunity here. So along comes uh, January, and I get a phone call saying I'm one of two finals for the job now. So um, I, I have to fly to Southern California to meet with George Arturis. He's the owner of the ball club at the time. So the night before I was to fly out, to Southern California to interview for the job, I went to a mall in Columbus for a cookie eating contest to kick off the Girl Scouts campaign. So there were eight radio and TV personalities. Wait, you went to commentate or you were just going as a spectator? No, as a, as a, as a participant, a cookie eating contest. <laughs> so there were eight of us because the Girl Scouts were kicking off their campaign and, and we went to this mall for a cookie eating contest. Okay. So I, I'm in this cookie eating contest, Adam. I eat 33 cookies in three minutes. You know, I don't even win the damn thing. I finished in third place. And I got a huge chocolate chip cookie from Mrs. Fields about that big. They just give and you so all next, sorts of diarrhea medicine on the way home. They're just Well, that's the thing what happened. Well, not the diarrhea, but the next morning, I always got up at 4 o'clock every morning to go to the radio station and do the morning drive sports. Then I did a game at night. That was my schedule in the minor it leagues. Dude, wasn't it so great to be oh. at that stage of life where you're like, you can burn the candle at both ends and not even be phased by it? Oh, you're like, dude, I'm going to wake up at four, go to bed at, at two, get, yeah. get a well, go to bed eating, at noon. Go to bed at noon. Go to the ballpark at two. Eat 33 cookies and then go do a game. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I eat these 33 cookies in three minutes. And next morning, I go to the radio station. I was, had to do my morning drive sports. And I was going to fly out about 10 o'clock in the morning, fly to Southern California, meet with the owner of the team. So that morning, I thought I was having a heart attack. My chest was killing me. I couldn't stand up. I called the team doctor, Doc Stevens. He said, meet me at the hospital. So I went to the hospital in Columbus, downtown Columbus. And he said, uh, what did you eat last night? I said, well, Doc, I was in this cooking contest with the Girl Scouts. He said, what? I said, yeah, I ate 33 cookies in three minutes. He said, geez. He said, you probably stressed your sternum, but I got to check you out for the heart attack. So I had to take a couple, a couple of blood tests like four hours apart. So I, I missed my flight to Southern California to meet George Ardress. I go, oh, my gosh, I just blew my opportunity to get a big league job. 
So you anyway, must have had so much rage towards the Girl Scouts of America oh, after that day. <laughs> oh, well, it's, there's a very happy ending. Okay, good. Okay, good. And so I called Melody Tucker and I said, Melody, I said, I'm going to miss my flight this morning to go see Mr. Rogers down in Southern California. I said, why? Girl Scouts had this cooking contest last night. I went to it at 33. They think I'm, I didn't have a heart attack, but they want to make sure that I didn't. So I'm going to miss my flight. She goes, what? She's like, yeah, this is the so, worst excuse of all time, Riz. <laughs> Exactly. Not buying so it. He goes, let me, and I made this phone call from a gurney with the EK mach, EKG machine attached to him. I said, I got to make this phone call. They rolled me out to the uh, reception office there room with my blue, blue gown on with my butt sticking out, you know, so i had to make this phone call. So she said, call me back in about a half an hour. This is long before the days of the cell phone. She goes, I'll call Mr. Address and see what the plan is. So I call back at about a half an hour. I go back out there again. I call her up. She says, can you be there tomorrow morning? Because he's got to leave the following day for a, a trip to Greece. and He's going to be gone for three weeks. I said, I will be there and whip these wires off me. I will be there tomorrow morning. So anyway, uh, long story short, if that's possible at this stage, uh, I didn't have a heart attack. I stressed my sternum because of the Girl Scout cookies, the campaign and the cooking contest. So I fly to Southern California. I go to Arnell Development, which is owned by George Argeris. Yeah. And I finally go in to meet Mr. Argeris. We sit down. He's a likable guy. Uh, and we sit down and we talk for the longest time. And, and after about an, an hour, it seemed like, Adam, he pointed at me like this. He said, now, why did you miss your appointment yesterday? And I said, well, the Girl Scouts had this cook-eating contest <laughs> to kick off the campaign a couple of nights ago. And I went along with seven other radio and TV personalities, and I ate 33 cookies in three minutes, stressed my start, and we, we laughed about it. So anyway, about five minutes later, we're talking, and then I'll swear, I'll never forget this as long as I live verbatim. Adam, he reached across his desk, and he shook my hand. He said, anybody willing to risk his life for the Girl Scouts is my kind of guy. He said, welcome aboard. You got the job. So that's how it became wow. the Salem Meredith. And I, get, I have the Girl Scouts to thank for it. So... Oh and, my a, and, a, and a stress sternum. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's incredible. Yeah. I mean, you know what? And that was, he probably really respected that you were, you, you just, I don't know, you, you were, uh, you had a priority and a commitment and, you know, some unforeseen things went down. You still called <laughs> to let them know it was like kind of out of your control. And thank God that he wasn't like, you know, also didn't, maybe he was, you know, uh, you know, he was like, well, did you win? And you were like, no. And he was like, no. well, we only, we only hire winners, Riz. So <laughs> you could not like, eat a couple more damn cookies. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I said, no, I could. I couldn't. That's incredible. So, but okay. So then you, you, that's gotta be, by the way, I mean, equivalent to a player getting the call to go to the show yeah. to be yeah. of putting in your time and grinding in, in triple a, and then to get that call after all that, especially, yeah. Are you just like on cloud nine? Is it just like, cloud are you nine. crying? Is it like, yeah. Yeah. I, I called, uh, I went back to the hotel uh, that night because uh, I was going to fly back to Columbus and Mr. Roger said, no, we're going to send you to Seattle because we want you to meet Dave Niehaus. We want you to visit with the radio station folks and the TV folks and the ball club. And uh, I said, okay. So I went back to the hotel. I called my mom and dad and my mom and dad were both crying. Then I started crying. Yeah, you know, of course. Eight years in the minor leagues. And they lived, they went through it with me. They would, they would come to Amarillo, Texas. And I have some great stories about Amarillo, Texas. Donnie Reynolds was my roommate. Harold Reynolds' older brother. No was way. My roommate. And one night, uh, my folks came to visit one week. And one night, uh, my mom said, why don't you invite a couple of guys over for spaghetti dinner? He invited the whole team. So the whole team showed up at our apartment. My mother was so happy. Loved it. it was great. Yeah, she loved it. So they went through the minor leagues, you know, with me. And, and you said so, you wanted to do this since you were 12. So they've known. 12 years old. Yeah. This, would you do what I used to do and, and, and yeah. turn the volume down on the game and commentate yeah. along with it? Yeah. My mother was the biggest uh, Cub fan in the world, Adam. You know, every time I came home from school, the Cubs were on TV. Jack Rickhouse was the longtime broadcaster for the Cubs. He was my hero besides Louis Aparicio of the White Sox. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I would go downstairs, turn down the sound on the TV set, and do play-by-play -play the Chicago Cubs. 
you know, bases are loaded. Here's Ernie Banks. And my mom would go, Ricky, what are you doing down there? I said, Mom, I'm busy. Ernie Banks is up with a base loaded, swinging a fly ball, and it's gone. Goodbye. You're <laughs> you like know? mid fight so, with her as you're commenting, like, Mom, yeah, yeah yes, ah, I want ah, spaghetti. Ah, two two ah, outs ah, in the ninth. Ah, two ah, outs. Ah, in, yeah, yeah, two outs in the ninth, and my mom won't stop badgering me about putting my uh, fishes away. Mom, tell me some slack. Full count. Come on, <laughs> Mom, give me a break. <laughs> she was the best. Oh, oh my wow. mother was the best mom in the world. She loved baseball. And I, so I watched games, you know, and listened to games with her during the day with the Cubs and my father, my dad at night with the White Sox. So I had the best of, uh, you know, both worlds. So I made that phone call and they were in tears, you know, and I finally made it. First thing that went through my mind was, I don't think I have to wake up at four o'clock every morning now to go to the ballpark, you know. Like I mean, that is. Minor leagues. So I could just concentrate on broadcasting. And it was uh, one of the greatest days uh, of my life, buddy. What did you know of the Mariners at that point? Like, I didn't know a whole lot, you know, because oh, the Mariners were way up there in that little burb in the northwest part of the country. I remember them becoming a uh, uh, an expansion team in 1969 with the Seattle Pilots, and I remember that because I loved the hat. I still got a pilot hat with me right back here. It's not the pitchfork, is it? No, it's got the scrambled eggs on it. You want me to go get it? Yeah. You hold yeah. on. All right. Don't go away. <laughs> wow. Did we just go to a commercial break on a podcast? <laughs> this is the best. Riz, you're killing it. It is right here. Holy this is the, shit. This is the Seattle Pilots hat. I want and, that. And I love this right here. It's the only hat that ever had anything on the bill like that. They called it scrambled eggs. That's you know? incredible. But uh, I remember the Pilots in 1969 came into existence with uh, – the Kansas City Royals were expansion team. The Montreal Expos yep. were expansion club. And the San Diego Padres, four teams in 1969, including the Pilots. And they were there in Seattle for one year and left uh, because uh, the ownership group there just didn't have the money to, to make it viable. And then uh, they left, became the Milwaukee Brewers. Bud Selig uh, bought the team, and they became Milwaukee, uh, the Milwaukee Brewers. And then in 1977, remember I told you about Slade Gordon? He saved yeah. baseball couple times at yeah. the time in 1969 he was the attorney general for the state of washington sued the american league because they broke the lease with the kingdom you know and so that's how the mariners were born oh, excuse me they were out at the uh, sixth stadium and so they sued the league to get a franchise back and they said you know if you drop the lawsuit we'll give you an expansion club so the mariners were born with the toronto blue jays in 1977 Dude, can we have like a Slade Gordon day or a sandwich He's or a, or a sex move? Like something to honor this guy? Like, He's hey, huge. baby, come on over. I'm going to give you the Slade Gordon. She's like, yeah. Yeah, I don't even know you yet. Like this guy <laughs> is a, a hero to our great state of Washington. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so then you, you meet Dave. What is, I mean, this, this relationship, you guys – I mean, again, I just can't – I'm going to try to speak. And I've told you this many times in, uh, you know, just you and I playing pool. By the way, people got to know this about Riz. You're not like – it's the same thing with Griff. You are as fun on mic as you are off. When we met at Vino Bella and started hitting it off, talking comedy, talking baseball, that's all dudes need. I've said this for years to really get some sort of a rapport. It's like, don't be a piece of shit. Like, have a <laughs> balance of eye contact. Nobody wants to just have someone staring at them while they're getting to know them. But you had a good balance of, of sports and comedy and life. And then it was like, the, we closed down Vino Bella. This is the offseason, yeah. by the way. And uh, <laughs> I don't want to let yeah. you know that there was a game at nine and Riz begged yeah. them to keep the bar open. No, it was the offseason. We've done that too, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have. We go to the, uh, the uh, uh, H&H. Bar, H&H play some pool, cool. have some cocktails, beer. and close that place down. And, yeah. man, it was, was like – it was awesome. You got a good pool game. We had some friends from Vina Bella and some comedy fans come over. Yeah. Just yeah, a good, good, good group hang. All across the Internet, you'll find mean-spirited articles with headlines like The Dumbest Town in America, The Drunkest, The Most Caffeinated. How would you even determine that? Hey, what's up, guys? Each week, I travel to a notorious American town. So you're the mayor and the barber. Yes. Marber? That's better than a lot of things I've been called. And give it a chance to throw down oh. and defend its reputation. Oh. Okay, that's definitely scary. I'm going to prove what each town is truly all about. This is Small Town Throwdown. 
Hey guys, Adam Ray here for the About Last Night podcast. Hope you're enjoying the episode. Man, it's good to be back. And you know what? The best part about being back is sharing the goodies with you, the fans. I love candles, okay? You know from listening to this podcast, we've always had candles living around the apartment and now my new place. And um, I'm tired of buying the bullshit candles from the store. I want some personal touch. I want something handmade. So that's why I found Hangover Candle Company. That's right. Homemade by a bartender in Fort Collins, Colorado. He's a big comedy fan, podcast fan. Reached out, said, I love the pod. Would love to some- send you some candles. I'm like, I'm not comfy giving you my address. He's like, come on, trust me. I was like, all right, let's roll the dice. Boom. Now I've got fucking 40 different flavors of Hangover Candle Company candles in my place. Um, they're... Cut, sanded, poured, packed, and shipped, all by him. Um, And you can choose from over 200 different containers, okay, to build your candle in. And over 40 different scents to create your own uh, smell. You can customize your own scents. Shit, man, they've got flavors like uh, fucking root beer, apple pie, cinnamon stick, coffee, fresh cut grass, uh, hazelnut, lavender, leather, maple syrup, peach, pine, sandalwood, spearmint, sea breeze, vanilla bean, watermelon. Go to Hangover Candle Co., uh, on Etsy, okay? Go to Etsy, type in Hangover Candle Co. It'll pop up at the shop, and then pick your candles, and then use the promo code ALN25 at checkout to get 25% off your first order. 25%! Hangover Candle Co. is on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, but again, go to Etsy, type in Hangover Candle Co., find the candles and the smells you want, create your own, and then use ALN25 at checkout to get 25% off your first order. I love candles. They're great for any occasions, bar mitzvahs, circumcisions, uh, uh, fucking weddings, funerals, gender reveal parties, uh, divorce parties, uh, coming out parties, coming in parties, coming parties. These candles are the shit, and they're my fave, and I want you guys to have them. So type in Etsy, Dot com and then type in Hangover Candle Co. and uh, and pick your candles and use ALN25 at checkout for 25% off. All right? Start smelling better. Start looking better. Start feeling better, okay? Because everybody farts, and candles are a great way to get rid of that. And now back to the episode. Uh, so I got to I got to assume that that's been in Riz so, uh, forever, and you're coming to meet Dave. Are you, are you like, all right, this is – I'm coming into this guy's booth, more or less. How do I yeah. fit in? And let him know that I'm, you know, a team player and I'm, hey, I'm, I'm yeah. in shotgun right now, but I want to also, you want to let him know that you're good at what you do, but not overstep boundaries and not flex yeah. too much, right? That's all, or do you just really, is it easier than that? No, no, that's, that's so important. That's a great question because, you know, when I came in, I, 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 I know who the star is, you know, at spring training, I, you know, I did my first game with him and I go, wow, this guy is really something special. And you could tell right away, you know, huh? I could tell right away, you know, it wasn't just the voice. He had the best voice in the world, but he, the way he told stories, the way he broadcast the game, the way he set things up, he was just amazing. He's in the Hall of Fame, went in in 2008. I knew that right away. So being the number two guy, you got to know who you are. You got to check your ego at the door. It's not about you. This guy is the guy. My job was to compliment him. So I decided very early that during the course of a ball game, you know, there's so many things going on. You might just see a base hit in left field, but there's a lot other things going on. Dave is doing a great job of making the call, line drive into the gap to left center field. There goes Junior out to get it. I'm watching the base runner. I'm watching the defense. I'm watching if there's going to be a play at the plate. I'm watching to see if he hits the base. I'm watching to see if there's a stumble because I, I can't add any more than what he's doing because what he's doing is perfect. It's great. So, But I can add something that he doesn't see and can't see it. Most guys can't see. So I just tried to fill in. So I tried to be the best number two broadcaster that I possibly could. And I got my opportunities, you know, with him when we did just radio, doing three innings of play by play. He did six, you know, so I had my chances. And then I think the, one of the smartest things I ever did, and I did it from the get go was to get out of his way to allow him the ability Mm -hmm. to be Dave Niehaus. And I think the most important thing I ever did was in 1995, when Edgar hit that double, I knew Edgar was going to hit the ball somewhere. I knew he was going to at least tie the game. He could hit a home run or whatever. But my, I, I reminded myself, get out of this man's way, Dave Niehaus. Because if something happens and it was going to happen, he was going to make the perfect call. He had the perfect setup. And he said, if you listen to the tape, oh, man, the Mariners would love a line drive into the gap right now to score joy from third. And then with junior speed. They could speed, win it with junior speed, yeah. And yeah. they could win it with junior speed. 
Well, there's the base hit down the left field line. Here comes Joey, tie game, junior the third. They're going to wave him in. The throw to the plate will be late, and the Mariners are going to play for the American League Championship. I don't believe it. My, oh, my, it just continues, and he went on and on and on. And the 0-1 pitch on the way to Edgar Martinez. Swung on the line, down the left field line for a base hit. Here comes Joy. Here is Junior to third base. They're going to wave him in. The throw to the plate will be late. The Mariners are going to play for the American League Championship. I don't believe it. I took my headphones off, Adam, and I'm jumping up and down, you know, with my headphones off. I'm running with Junior because I know this guy here Got is going to make the biggest call, the greatest call in the history of the franchise. And then when Junior scored, I finally sat down, put my headphones on, and I waited, and I waited, I waited, because I knew that every word that he was saying right there was going to be remembered till the end of time. And I didn't want to step on him. So I made sure that it was completely finished, you know. And then oh, it would have been it would have been awful if if he's oh, like Junior scored and they're gonna wave him in, and then yeah. you just jump in and go, Junior oh. fast, Dave. He, I think yeah. if he makes it, I hope he slides. Junior's he's so fun. cool. He's so cool, <laughs> man. I hope he comes hangs with us after at H and H. Oh shit! Take it away, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God I didn't do that. <laughs> so I waited, waited. Then he looked at me like he was just like. Oh, it was like unbelievable. He'd made the greatest call in the world, but one of the greatest announcers of the history of the game. Then I jump in. Dave, pandemonium here in the kingdom. Junior being mobbed. Edgar Mar Martinez being mobbed at home plate. Fans are hugging and kissing each other, going crazy. These fans, this, and I did say, this is a game for the ages. You know, fans here in the Northwest will remember this till the end of time. I said, this is a, a game that, for the ages and I'm glad I said that but I waited until he was done because as a number two guy check the ego at the door let this guy do his job and learn from him and I learned so much from Dave Niehaus 25 years I was with him Adam I sat next to him every day for 25 years we were together more than we were with our families and uh, I learned from him at a very early age at a very early stage in my life that it may not be a great game but it, it, it can be a great broadcast. And that's what Dave Niehaus meant to you as a young fan since 1977. You know, we didn't win a lot of ball games, but people had a reason to tune in. It was because of that guy right there. Not too many guys have a statue in their ballparks. The Mariners do of Dave Niehaus out there in right center field. They got a street named after him. So I'll never forget the lessons that I learned from him. Day one, opening day, 1983, I was so pumped up, Adam. It was like maybe your first time on stage. And I was so like this, you know. So Dave is doing the play-by-play -play and everything. We're playing the Yankees and Gaylord Perry's pitching. And uh, there's a fastball in the outside corner for strike. Yeah, Gaylord, you know, he's got a little extra energy. You know, today it's opening day. And here Gaylord Perry, the ancient mariner. Then Dave calls the next play and, and next pitch. So after about uh, an inning of me jumping in all the time, Dave calmly reaches over turns off my mic and he says you don't have to talk after every pitch <laughs> and i said okay 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 yeah, so but, i'm sorry sorry mr I, i'm sorry, sorry sorry but after eight years of the minor leagues you know i didn't want to blow it here i am jumping on this guy all the time so i wow. learned day one you know you don't have to talk over you know the hall of famer after every pitch and so i learned that balance and life is balanced no matter if you're a, sure. a great comedian or actor like you are one of the greatest actors of all time <laughs> along with sandra bullock 32 yeah. movie she um, will hear this she will hear this uh, i'm sending her a direct she's, link <laughs> she's a sweetheart man oh my god she's Riz, unbelievable greatest Riz, actress like, of all time unbelievable things, yeah unbelievable. but uh, I, I learned very early you know this guy was something special we became best friends uh, we hung out after the ball games, go to the bars and have a drink, go to the press room. Back in the old days, we had press rooms right at the ballpark. And the broadcasters and the writers would show up and sit and have a few, you know, soft drinks after the game and just talk baseball. And that was the greatest time was after the ball game to just sit and listen to these guys. Don Drysdale in Chicago, you know, or Gene Autry in Anaheim. George Brett would come up to the booth and the press room in Kansas City because uh, Ken Brett, his older brother was our analyst in the mid 1980s. Oh wow! So those were those were really special times. But I learned a lot from Dave Niehaus. If it wasn't for Dave, 
I wouldn't be here. He got me here twice. Once as a young broadcaster, as you know, in 1983. Then I yeah. went away to Detroit to replace Ernie Harwell, which was really difficult. They let me go right before the 95 season. Thank God that happened when it did. And uh, Dave got me back again. So yeah. I owe Deep House everything. So he, because that, you know, they had, I think that's when maybe when Ron Fairley and um, yeah. a few other guys uh, came over. And uh, yeah, that's, cr- that Kendall, seems. Ken, Kendall Bryan, Chip Carey. Because I left yeah. after the 91 season. So did Joe Simpson. Joe went to Atlanta. I went to Detroit. Yeah. So they hired Ron Fairley, Chip Carey, and Kenny Levine. And it, that's got to be kind of uh, unprecedented to leave and get to go back to yeah. because you left what to, to go to Detroit to be the guy to be what Dave was yeah. in Seattle. Yeah, and, yeah, I and, replaced Ernie Harwell. Yeah, and so for them to have you come back, I mean, Dave must have been like, "Yeah, this is my guy." You must have planted enough seeds in uh, in Dave's world and been such a joy that he yeah. fought for you to come back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's why, you know, uh, at his memorial, I broke down because, you know, I said he got me here as a young broadcaster and he got me back, you know, again for a second time. I knew that the Tigers were going to make a change. I knew that Ernie wanted to come back on a full-time basis. We brought him, I was there in 92, a lot of turmoil when Ernie was gone. 93, we brought him back and I worked with Ernie. Ernie did three innings of play-by-play that year and then would leave the booth. And then in 94, retired again. And then after the 94 season, strike hit in August of 94. A week before Christmas, they let me go. But before they did, I knew it was going to happen. So I called Dave. I called Kevin Kremen, Randy Adamak. And I said, guys, uh, this isn't working out here. And Dave said, we'll get you back. And he did. He kept his promise. And they worked out a deal where Ron went from radio to TV. First day of spring training in 1995, I walked up to Ron Fairley. He said, Red, I said, thank you very much for what you did. He said, Ricky, he said, you've been here for a long time. You know, uh, you and Dave so cool. have a great relationship. He said, that's fine. I'm fine with that. And I said, thank you, buddy. So we became best friends right away. And he sadly passed away uh, last November. But uh, we had a great crew, Adam, you know, with Kevin Kremen and Dave and Ron Fairley and all Kremen, the guys man. that we worked with, you know, down through the years. And then uh, Dave Henderson came along and JB and my son. Is your son, yeah, what up? In. That's my little baby. That's <laughs> oh, Nick. Yeah. Nick. What up, Nicky? Yeah, what's up, bud? This Good is Adam, you, man. Man. Adam Good Ray. Man, that's that's my you. little baby. <laughs> what do you got? What do you, what do you want to run your neck? Dude? What is that? It's a respirator. Yeah, he's uh, cutting down trees outside. Oh so I'm my. glad I'm doing the podcast here with you. Yeah, I thought it was like a sleep apnea mask. I was like, dude, you can take it <laughs> off now. You know that, right? <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he was – hi, buddy. How you doing? Nick, you're cutting down trees? Is that what you said? Yeah, just trimming uh, his front tree. Nice, dude. What a good son. Yeah. This yeah, is why you have awesome. kids, right? To do your yard exactly. work. Exactly. Yeah. Big benefits, exactly. yeah. Yard, yard work. A... No, do your homework. No. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Nick, I see you got a tattoo. What is it of? I'm, I'm in the, uh, the world of maybe getting one soon. Yeah, oh. it's just some tribal stuff. Nice, uh, dude. Now, now, do the triceps come with the tattoo? Or do I have to do push No, you have to work it, though. <laughs> I work out every day for two hours and run. Yeah, At Riz, dude. Five to 13 miles every day. I don't have them. <laughs> Riz, I don't know, man. Last time I saw you, and it's clear that you're keeping it up, the definition was creeping up uh, pretty steadily. Yeah. I, I lost what- uh, 30 pounds a few years ago. I got well, went to 180, and I walked in the bathroom one time. My stomach got there before I did, and I went, whoa, something's got to happen here. Yeah, I looked dude. Like I was five months pregnant, so I got rid of it. I lost 30 pounds, got the one down to 150, and so I'm right around there now. Yeah, you're killing it. Yeah, when you look down to pee and you don't know where it's coming from, that's a problem. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, it's good to see your wiener. <laughs> that's great. You're like, oh, it's actually it's a wiener wow. on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice being there to get to the farm. Hey, what's, what's that? He's, he's got to right, go some pigs. All right, man. Take care, bud. Bye, buddy. Hey. Love, love you. Do your push-ups. Do your triceps. Yeah, dude. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Man. I've got these 1996 arms still, dude. Like, there you go. You got some guns. Oh, Adam's dude. a comedian oh. and an actor, and he's, he's awesome. He's fantastic. Yeah, so I don't have to have – I've got a comedian's body, you know? Quit yeah, busting Sandra, my balls, Nick. Sandra, <laughs> Sandra Bullock blew him up at the end of the movie Heat. I was so upset with Sandra. Yeah, yeah. How could you do that to my buddy? Well, I got a little uh, motorboat in there before I got blown up. So. You did. Yeah, remember mm-hmm. in the club scene, yeah. No, I know that. I still, that's I still have not washed awesome. this face. Uh, oh, that's that's awesome. <laughs> uh, Ricky, Love do um, uh, Love you. Nikki, Rick, do uh, do those in between moments? Do those like you were saying that the post hang? But like in those in between moments, 
you know, cause we, uh, it was, it's fun to get to, you know, shoot the shit with you in the booth and with you guys and the other, uh, broadcasters and Goldsmith doing a great job. And yeah, he's uh, Sims. Yeah. you guys got a great crew now. And, yeah. and Rye Roland, uh, did you and Dave, like, I don't know, did you get to know, like, remember the famous peanut guy in uh, the kingdom? Oh, Rick Kaminsky. Yeah. Yes. Did you guys like oh, yeah. get to know the yes. characters at the don't? Yeah. Okay. And yeah. like, would you yeah, guys Ricky like was at spring training all the time? Uh, no way. And he would throw peanuts up into the booth at spring training because we were right there behind home plate and he'd fire up a bag of peanuts, you know? And I asked him one time, I said, what's your accuracy rate? Do you keep track? He says, Oh yeah. He was like 98% accurate. He tossed the peanut bag behind his back and, you know, right to the waiting hands of people. But if somebody walked, into you know the line, <laughs> the of, line sight, of fire you know, whammo they get a oh, bag dude. of peanuts in their face yeah those were some of but my he, favorite moments in games because this guy people don't understand you've got the guys that are just like hey they're like peanuts and he's like like a light toss like yeah. you know just over his shoulder this guy you'd be three sections away and you yeah. go peanuts and he go and he go and see you and go and point at you and then go you ready you ready and then you go put yeah. your hand up like this and make you hold the hand up almost like the way that Benny the Jet hit the ball to the kid in the sandlot. He was like, just hold your glove up. I'm going to get that ball there. So you yeah. hold your hand up as a little kid, and this guy would just – and he'd you know, hit it in his, in his palm like this and then just whisk it behind his back yeah. at no joke, probably like 15, 20 miles an hour, and this yeah. thing would whiz across. And, yeah, if nobody got in front of it and you had decent palms as a, as a child, you were going to snap some peanuts out of midair and, and feel like a rock star. And when yeah. it did blow up, I mean, also incredible. <laughs> and he would walk over and give you a fresh bag because he was a, a gem right. of, a per, of a person. But he was great. Yeah. Those types Ricky of moments. Was... Oh, yeah. That's great that you guys got to know him. And did, oh, did, yeah. you, did you guys, um, you know, mid game, would you, what were the conversations like about the game or life or because you're with each other so much? Everything. Yeah. Most of the ball, you know, during the course of the ball game was, is about the game, you know. Uh, you know, what was going on and, man, what's going to Lou do in this situation? Of that? that was the beauty of Lou Pinot, by the way, too, is, you know, you were in his office every day at 3 o'clock. And when I did the manager show, Dave and I would alternate. Uh, John McLaren would come in, and they'd go over the lineup. And I'd go, fellas, you want me to leave? And they said, no, I'll stay right there. Yeah, it's okay. It's all right. And then he would go through the lineup and say, okay, in the seventh inning, I'll pinch hit for Danny here. I'll do this. We'll do this, this, this. And sure enough, here comes the seventh inning. Lou would do that. The eighth inning to do this. He'd bring in that guy. And he had that game mapped out, you know, at three o'clock in the afternoon. So Dave and I would talk about that. What do you think Lou's going to do here? What, what? But we'd also talk about, you know, funny stories, you know, that happened too in life. But most of that was before the game or after the ball game or on the plane or at the hotel or at dinner. You know, we spent so much time together. I just love the man, his wife, Marilyn. I watched his kids grow up. He watched yeah. Nicky grow up. Yeah. You know. Pre-triceps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's a big kid. And he, oh, man. Yeah. He worked construction, you know, all his life. So I mean, that's, that's the that's the best because the body just, it, it, even if you don't have it, it's going to come with what you're doing, which is. Yeah. Did you and Dave uh, talk a lot when A-Rod got, um, let go, or I guess just didn't resign with us, right? Uh, yeah. we, we didn't trade for, we didn't trade him. He just, no, he was a free agent. He signed right. a $252 million contract with the Texas Rangers. I mean, you know, at the time. And, uh, yeah. So we were wondering, you know, that's bubbling. That's brewing. Cause I remember even listening to the, a broadcast they're replaying all these old M's games on, on route uh, sports. And I think it was the game six in New York and Costas is, uh, broadcasting it. Meanwhile, this could be Alex Rodriguez's last at bat. As a Seattle Mariner, depending upon what happens in the offseason. And he drives one to deep left. Back near the wall and gone. Well, if that's the way he says goodbye, he does it with some style. But even the games prior to that that they've aired, you guys are talking about, like, you know, is this the last time we see him in an yeah. Mariner's uniform? And do those rumblings start early in the season, or is it once he clearly is – uh, defined himself as the best player in baseball and the contracts up that you're like, we don't, cause you don't want to almost sour the season by yeah, talking no. about it so much. Right. But it's, no. inevitable. yeah, you don't want to really bring it up that much because you know, you don't want fans thinking too many negative things about, you know, we're going to lose this kid, you know, is he going to sign? Is he not going to sign? We, Dave and I always felt like we'll leave the business stuff, you know, off the field and, and later on after the season, if we have to talk about something, we will address it. 
you know, especially if it's in the headlines, you know, that day and you just say, hey, I hope this kid signs with the ball club. The Mariners would, I know, would love to have him back, but it is a business. You know, you got it. You have a budget and we don't have the richest budget in the world at that time. We can't compete with the Yankees as far as, you know, dollars or things like that. Oh, That's yeah. why I'm surprised he went to Texas, you know, like he did. But, uh, you know, if you have to talk about things, Dave, Dave was really honest, you know. He would, he would tell you what, he, you know, he was thinking. But uh, eventually, if something my, – my philosophy was, you know, I'll really talk about something when I see the press release in front of me. Uh, the, the front office, I'm sure, didn't like us to talk about speculation. We'd leave that, you know, to the writers and everything yeah. like that. But like I said, if we have to address something, we would. Uh, and uh, – but, um, you know, uh, otherwise I would just wait until I actually saw a press release to – uh, tell people what was going on. My job was to do play by play. Right. It wasn't to be invested. Speculate and. I, my job was to find out who these players were, you know, as human beings, and tell stories, you know, about them, so the fans could relate to them. And uh, so that's that's what I try to stay with for 45 years. How much of that, when you're getting to know them in the, uh, you know, spring training, and then I know you guys would do the pre and post game shows and go down early to just, you know, chat with them at batting practice. How much of that are you then taking to the broadcast to, when you're filling time? Like, you're like, well, actually, I just found out that, uh, you yeah. know, Paul Sorrento actually is a uh, trained to be a magician for five years. But uh, he's <laughs> colorblind, so he couldn't – he always fucked up the card trick. So then he became a first baseman. Like, did you ever get little, you know, little tidbits like that that you would pull in? Sure. Yeah. And that's that's what that time is for. When you, I get to the ballpark at one thirty, two o'clock in the afternoon – and my goal is to have my notes done right here at this kitchen table, done by uh, 8 o'clock, uh, 9 o'clock in the morning. I make a cup of coffee, you know, and uh, do my notes, get my book ready. But then then I can spend more time with the players when I get to the ballpark around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, ask them questions, tell, have them tell me a story. And then I always say, hey, can I use this on the radio? I want to make sure that it's okay with them. So if, if their wife hears it or if they hear it, already, hey, that wasn't for – you know, publication or for you to blab on, on the radio, I always say, can I use that story? Is that all right? Because it's a great story. So, yeah, that's that's what uh, we use that time for. And you find out who these people are because, you know, they're just like you and me. But the good Lord blessed them with the ability to hit a, a round ball with a round bat squarely or run like a gazelle or have a cannon for an arm like Jay Buhner, you know. And you find out the bottom line is when you take off that uniform, they're they're just great guys you know and that's what i want to uh emote to people to let people know you know who these guys are jay buner had the biggest heart in the world he cared oh, yeah. about people cared about his family cared about you uh you know in the minor leagues you're one of the guys you're in this you're in the buses together and those long bus rides and everything in the big leagues it's a little bit different now you're kind of part of the media and not so much a part of the team although you travel with them and in 1995 after a ball game in boston you know, the guys were going out for a few drinks and Norm Charlton came up to me and said, hey, Ricky, what are you doing after the ball game? Jay and I are going to go out for every drinks at uh, Daisy Buchanan. He said, want to come with us? And I said, yeah, I'd love yeah, to. Hell yeah. Know? So, uh, awesome. you know, I spent uh, a night with the guys, you know, at the bar, just having a great time. Just one of the guys again. That really made me feel good because, you know, it was it was something special. Uh, that's so cool. Did you and Dave talk a lot about and did – you know, I know this was like a detrimental time. Are you good for about another 15 minutes, Rizzy? Anytime. You, okay, as good. long as you want, buddy. Okay, great. All right, good. Yeah. Um, well, then cancel your plans tomorrow because we're not stopping, baby. I got cookies <laughs> sent to your house, and we're closing gonna... this podcast with a cookie-eating contest so you can break your record. Where are you um, going to play this? <laughs> oh, everywhere, dude. This is people – this is going to be a, a big up. Uh, d did you guys – when so Randy leaves in '98, correct? He left after the '98 season, yeah, or, or during the '98 season. During the '98 season, we traded him to Houston for Freddy Garcia, John Alama, and Carlos right? Guillen, and John Alama. So we were able to get something. That was that sucked, yes. but yeah. I think right away when you guys started breaking down the value we got back, you're like, "All right, it's a business. At least we got something because we got something." And yeah. we have all seen trades get blown up in your face where. He wanted to go, and we had to fit, try to get something for it. It's like you have to step out of denial and be like, no, we can find a way to keep him. you got to be like, well, let's just be proactive in finding something in return yeah. so that we don't completely lose the best pitcher in baseball and get nothing in return. So that, right. that, was, that sucked, but that was – It worked out. It worked out. 
Um, we got we got a quality pitcher in oh. Freddie Garcia was out, one of the best pitchers in the history of our franchise. We got a starting shortstop in Carlos Guillen. Oh yeah, and Halama and, was yeah, John Halama was our fifth fifth starter swing totally. guy, and did a good job for us. Uh, Junior then leaves in '99, and another kind of Junior was traded away. I uh, traded away, and and that was another Mike Cameron. Yeah, with getting Mike Cameron and Junior even leaving was again like <clears throat> you can't even fathom that that's possible but all the reasons you couldn't really argue with huh like being close to fam playing for his dad's team i mean that truly yeah. right i mean like what do you what do you say and and he kind of he kept it helped us keep the team so you're kind of like i mean yeah. right like is that yeah. kind of how you guys felt or yeah yeah you know it's tough because you know you love this kid you saw him as a 17 year old kid when we drafted him you know, I saw him play in the minor leagues one game. We were in Anaheim, Ken Brett and I, we did a game in the afternoon against the Angels. He said, hey, Bellingham's playing San Bernardino, you know, tonight. Let's go watch him. So I had a chance to see him play in a minor league game. So you watch this kid grow up, you know, in the system and become a major leaguer and then become eventually a Hall of Famer. And you understood how much he loved the game. Great pred pedigree, but what a great kid he was. So you just fall in love with this kid. You can't help it. And uh, what he meant to uh, Seattle, he helped save baseball in Seattle. Yeah. Ah, uh, Fernandez glove. There goes Joey. The pitch swung off at Nelson. Deep to right field. The Mariners have done it. Fly away. Junior with a two-run home run. And the Mariners have got the eighth inning ape off their back. They were old for 43. Junior's two-run home run. The Mariners win it. Nine to seven, my, oh my. And then to have him go was was obviously very, very difficult. But, you know, he wanted to leave for whatever reasons he had. He wanted to leave. Uh, that's when Pat Gillick came in for Woody Woodward to make that trade. How do you trade the best player in the game of baseball? You better come up with something. And we came up with Mike Cameron and Brett Tomko and this kid, Tony Butler. And I think uh, one or two other guys were also involved in that trade. But Mike Cameron was the key. And uh, he had to, he had the, an enviable task to replace Junior out in center field, but he did, Yeah. you know, because he had that smile just like Junior had. He also had ability, he had that great talent to, to uh, you play center field and to hit, you know. And I'll never forget uh, early in the season when he robbed Derek Jeter of a home run. 357, the 0-2 pitch, swing and a fly ball, hit in the deep center field, Cameron going back to the track, to the wall. Makes the leap and makes the catch. My, oh my. I hate to say it, but it was a grippy ass catch. Oh, yeah. But in left center field, it was like, hey, the torch is passed. At spring training of that year, without Griffey, we know it's going to be tough for Cameron. And Dave and I on the radio told the fans in the Northwest, say, please welcome this kid. You know, he wasn't a kid at the time. You know, he was with the Chicago White Sox in Cincinnati and the traded to us give this young man an opportunity. He's filling the biggest shoes in the history of the game of baseball over the previous 20 years, maybe, you know, give him a standing ovation, you know, an opening day, welcome him, wrap your arms around him, take a little pressure off him. Sure enough, an opening day, the fans did, you know, he came in from center field with a red carpet treatment and all that. And uh, Mike Cameron, because of that, and of course the way he played and related to the fans, he would, you know, uh, the fans really took him in. Oh, yeah. He would he would take a little uh, folding chair after a ball game, uh, once a series, I think, and sit it on top of the dugout at him. And after the ball game, sit there and sign autographs until he signed every autograph. Wow. You know, I, not, I never saw guys do that. Cal Ripken did it once uh, every homestand. You know, in Baltimore, fans were lined all the way outside of Camden Yards. But Cammy Cammy did that. He fell in love with the fans. They fell in love with him. And he was able to come in and – and follow Junior. No one was ever going to replace him. Nope. Thank, thank God Junior came back when he did in 09 and 10. And I, I got a picture of Junior's last hit on my wall, you know, back wow. here. Wow. The 2 1 pitch to Junior. Swung on line to the right field for a base hit. Around third. Here comes Bradley. Junior has won the ball game. So I saw his first hit, a double into the gap in left center field in Oakland in 1989 off of Dave Stewart. 20, 25 years from now, you're going to want to say, I was there when Ken Griffey Jr. made his home debut. 
So don't forget that on Monday night. There's a drive into the gap in left center field and deep left center field. And Henderson's not going to get to it. It's off the base of the wall. And Griffey to second base in his first major league at bat. A ringing double off the 375 marker. And we have seen that all spring. Welcome to the show, Ken Griffey Jr. I saw many of his home runs out of the back to backs. I mean, the back to back, the back to backs, Ken. father and son. We're never, we're never going to see that again in the history Ever. of the game of baseball. Fly ball sliced to fairly deep left center field. Debo White back to the track, the wall, makes the leap, and the old man has done it one more time. Fly away. Run trot, yes, yeah. 3 0 pitches hit deep in the left center field, and Bishop will look up, and father and son have hit back to back home run. Ever. Unless, I mean, you know, it's um, shit, man. Unless, you know, unless you get your triceps to where Knicks are at and you guys somehow <laughs> get into the show in the next couple of years and they let you be the first broadcast player but yeah it uh, that was amazing you know so many, so many moments like that and in the 116 game season i think nobody nobody could foresee because you lose three no. i mean it's still talked about in this day when people talk about the mariners where they go how did they lose arguably the three best players in baseball at that time and and yeah. probably on a short list of i mean griffey of course even Alex Randy, they, I mean, truly, in that decade, all probably could, could vie for best of their position and, uh, and in the top of, of all time. To lose them one after the other, I mean, you're just kind of like, all right, we hit the reset button in 2001, right? Is that kind of yeah. the mentality? Exactly. They freed up some yeah. cash. I mean, even though I was at that game when A-Rod came back and, it, and they dropped a bunch oh, of fake oh. money, <laughs> and that was incredible. And it was, you know, the fans, it was very cathartic. You know, there were some things that were said around kids that I was like, all right, I think the money sent the message, but I get it, you know, <laughs> say what you got to say, sir. They were upset. But, uh, but did, were you guys just like, all right, 2001 is going to be just kind of a let's see what happens? Yeah. We, we had, again, going into the 2001 season, we had no idea what type of ball club we were going to have. We, we lost uh, Randy Johnson a few years before that. Then Junior was straight away, and Alex Rodriguez signed as a free agent. However, Pat Gillick put together a team. He put together a great team. We got this little guy from Japan. We had no idea what he was going to do. Ichiro Suzuki. You had no incredible, clue. Incredible numbers over there, you know, for, what, nine seasons with the Orcs Blue Way. But how was that going to translate to Major League Baseball? Well, we found out right away. He became a Hall of Fame player. Brown ball, base in in the right field. Heading for third is Terrence Long. The throw by Ichiro. Beautiful. Peggy got him. He had about 372 his first year. Was American League Rookie of the Year and MVP of the league. First guy to do that <laughs> since Freddie Lynn in 1975 with the Boston Red Sox. So here's Ichiro comes in. Has a great year. We still have Jay Buhner and Dan Wilson. We still have Edgar Martinez. Mike Cameron out in center field. We got John Olerud at first base. Mm -hmm. Here got David Bell over third base. Here comes Brett Boone. Booney had bounced around with a couple of teams he was with us. We had him traded to away start, right? Cincinnati. Yeah. yeah, we had Booney. Then we traded him away to Cincinnati. Then he had a bad knee with San Diego. He was with Atlanta. And then we get him. And the fly ball hit to deep right center field. And that baby is gone. Number 37 for Brett Boone, who has just taken the lead in the league in RBI. And Booney had an MVP year as well. He had like 30 home runs and drove in 141 runs and hit 331. So, I mean, it was just a great team. And we had a great bench. We had a great pitching oh, staff. Oh, Macklemore. You had yeah. – um, uh, yeah. uh, uh, not Al Martin. Maybe Al Martin. I mean, Al Martin was on that ball club as well. Jeff Nelson yeah. and Rhodes in the pen. And then yeah, Sasaki. Kassiro Sasaki, who had 45 saves that year. Every so boxer was checked. came back. As yeah. you mentioned, Jeff Nelson and Rhodes were outstanding in seventh through the eighth inning. Here comes Kazu. Third base, and your winner, Seattle. So it became a great team, and Lou Pinella knew all the right buttons to push and strings to pull, and and uh, I give Pat Gillick a lot of credit for putting that ball club together and Lou making everything work and they went out and they just won in april they won 20 games in may they won 20 games 
And uh, all of a sudden, they got this huge lead. They just kept right on going. Then 9-11 hit, one of the saddest days, if not the saddest day in the history of our franchise, of, of the country. Yeah. Of the country. Yep. And then we came back about eight days later and clinched in September. And I'll never forget the celebration, which was so emotional with Mike, uh, Mark McLemore and Mike Cameron holding the United States flag out of the mound. And they talked about how they would clinch. And they had that amazing uh little ceremony right there in the middle of the diamond but it was just a a, a heck of a club that uh, knew how to play the game the right way they they rooted for each other just like the 95 ball club did and they went out and won more games than anybody in the history of the game of baseball it was a really a fun team to watch it came to the ball did jamie moyer oh yeah it was just incredible oh yeah you know, all-time mariner <clears throat> yeah and, uh, you know, just uh, one great story after another. And they just went out there and won a lot of ball games. Is, is it, it's obviously, I mean, you could feel it as a fan, it was way more fun to go to games, even on a weeknight, because of knowing that you're the best team in baseball. And also, it, it was, you, you knew and loved every player. Some seasons you get, you know, and, and we're uh, in the midst of one right now where, where um, and hopefully things get going, where, you know, you, you got some, familiar faces you got some new faces but you're still you're trying to you know build that camaraderie and love for the whole team on a whole right and and just get to know because yeah. there's still a lot of unproven parts but in, with that squad you knew everybody you loved everybody they all contributed and uh so you went to the park and david bell would get as loud of an ovation as jay buner or ichiro yeah. and that yeah. was that's rare in in the game to have that type of a uh full support from from the fans so i'm sure going into the booth you're just like all right like i mean you're just excited because you're you you know that everyone coming to the whether it's going to be boone being the hero of the night or or uh you Mac know Lamore, Mac Dan Lamore, Wilson, yeah. or john olerud i mean it was just aaron seeley uh you know freddie garcia jamie moyer uh joel pinero ryan Pinero, franklin yeah. i mean yeah, yeah it was just uh you know, one guy after another, Stan Javier would eventually get in the ball game somewhere, oh, yeah. come up with a big hit or a stolen base or make a great play defensively. It's just, it was such a fun team to watch because they had each other's back. You know, baseball is a team game and those guys epitomized the word team. They, they rooted for one another. They had each other's back. Jay Buhner in 95 was the, you know, heart and soul of that team. He was still there in 2001 and and uh, it was just uh, fun going to the ballpark because you knew they were gonna they were gonna win a ball game. I, I gotta check this out, but I don't think they lost two games back to back until Holy the month shit. of August. You know they were they were that good. I've got to check that, but uh, it was it was a great team to be around. They it so must have been fun. it must have been fun too to just like go to opposing parks, and I'm sure you had other uh, broadcasters that you were friendly with, and ha and kind of look at them, and they'd probably from time to time be like. All right. Well, you guys really just found the magic uh, tick. Like, what's what's the secret or like little banter yeah. of like, shit? Are you guys gonna? Can you let us have one this weekend? Right? Like, no, oh, no. They yeah. wanted to go out and win every ball game, and they oh, came yeah. to the ballpark knowing they were gonna win. That's you right. know, they had that confidence from the time they woke up in the morning till the time we got to the ballpark, and they usually won when they left the ballpark. You know, so it was a lot of fun that year, and the coaching staff was great, and it was just. You, it was really a special feeling, and, uh, you know, it doesn't happen every year like that. Obviously, you don't win 116 games very often. Only two teams have ever done that, the 1908 Chicago Cubs yeah. and the 2000, uh, 2001 Seattle Mariners. And now Suzaki is set. And now the right-hander is to the plate with the 0-2 to A-Rod. Swing! And a foul tip into the glove of Dan Wilson, who hangs on to it. And no baseball team in history has ever won more games than the Seattle Mariners. But there was a great cast of characters that all brought something to the plate. Yeah. And when that happens, man, you got a great baseball stew and you win a lot of games. Rizzy, you, you've you been so brilliant with the um, Griffey, Edgar, uh, the Hall of Fame, the Mariner Hall of Fame. Yeah, the, those are um, fun. Those days when you do pregame, and then some. There's been days where they've just. There's been a day where you host the uh, the event, and you're so, just so perfect for for those uh, events. And uh, and you know, being the voice of the Mariners, it's such a uh, an added bonus to have you kind of commentating through the uh, 
bringing up memories and bringing up players and and it's just really special and I want to know for you is uh how much like prep goes into that are you just really I know you got pages of info and stuff but for yeah. Griffey like when Griffey came back and then which was insane there he goes if it's lined in the right field that's gonna get down for a base hit so Sedania is going to make it to third and the Mariners are open for business on opening day Runners at first and third and only one man down. What else do you expect? Junior to come through on opening day with a base hit. I don't know if you even knew before we did that that was going to happen. Were you texting with him? Was he like, hey, Riz, like, you know, you still got that uh, candy bar from, you know, <laughs> is I, maybe we can share it together when I'm playing with you guys next year. Like, does he give you any sort of hint? Uh, yeah, yeah, that it, that it might happen, but. You know, those those wonderful events on the field pregame, uh, I got to give Kevin Martinez all the credit in the world and Mandy Lincoln and everybody with the marketing department. Uh, Kevin is the one that puts together the script, and I work with him a little bit on it. I say, how about if we do this? How about if we do that? But yeah. he's really the genius behind that, and Mandy Lincoln and Camden Finney and Greg Green. Nobody in Major League Baseball puts on a better show before a ball game, during the course of the game, then those folks in the marketing department with the Seattle Mariners. And they're all very, very special. And they're just so right on. They, yeah. They're able to capture the moment. And I'm, I guess I'm the guy because I, I, I've had a chance to watch those games, broadcast those games, get to know those games. So I get a chance to add my touch to it. But really, it's, it's Kevin Martinez, Mandy Lincoln, Camden Finney, Greg Green, and, and those folks. And that's why it just – all seems to work. And then you, you bring in the other former players or current players too, and the people in the front office, you know, to join in. And it just, it tells, it, it tells the whole story from beginning, middle and end. And then you're ready to uh, do the ball game. Like junior, when he went into the Mariners hall of fame, yeah, it's supposed to go, uh, I think five minutes. So we're getting ready to play them. I think it's the Milwaukee Brewers. And he's supposed to go five minutes. Junior goes 24 minutes. The starting pitcher's in the bullpen, you know, warming up. And I'm getting the, the wrap-up sign. I'm sitting there, you know, with John Stanton and Kevin Mather and other people. And I'm getting a wrap-up sign. Junior's up at the podium. I said, you want me to go up there and tell him to sit down and shut up? I ain't, ain't going to happen. So I just let Junior go and go, no, it's his night. you oh, know. Yeah. So, so we start a little bit late, no problem. He ended up going typically 24 minutes. That was the number that he That's wore. Awesome. I'm not going to tell no stories. Uh, okay, maybe one. Uh, of all people that I would consider my brother from another mother, A guy who listens to country music, wears cowboy boots, big belt buckles. I got 17 speakers in a car, sweatsuits, rap music, two people that are so far apart on every level became really close. Now, I don't know if that's the pitching changes that we had and I went over to left, I mean right field, and he came over. But there is no other person in, in this world, other than my parents, that if, if something ever happened to me or my wife, that I would want to raise my kids. And it was just a, a, a beautiful night. But uh, those, those are great nights. And I'm 
it's, I'm very proud and privileged to be able to be a part of it. Uh, Rizzy, all right, before we wrap up here, and this has been amazing, you, uh, you know, I've been wanting to do this for, yeah. uh, what, what were we looking at? Was there a tree that I Nick missed that's clock. coming through the we, house? We do this oh, for okay. an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Time flies, huh? That's awesome, buddy. Yeah. yeah you're crushing it. This is going to be a, a special yeah. app for, for many people is, is there a, um, I want to do a kind of a, a quick Q and a with you, just a, a, t a quarantine, sure. a quarantine, uh, a check in, which, okay. you know, I know you said you've found a nice routine with your walks and your dinners and, uh, and some books. So you, you've been keeping yourself busy awaiting that call that the season's resuming. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm watching a lot of TV, watching a lot of movies. I'm going to watch the heat tonight. Is there, uh, the movie, the heat <laughs> yeah, starring Adam, Adam Ray, Sandra <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bullock. Yeah, my name's first McCarthy. on the bill. Melissa yeah. McCarthy and I went to the same school, went to Southern Illinois University. No yeah. shit. Go, go Salukis. Yeah. So I've been watching movies. I've watched a lot of baseball games. I've watched uh, uh, the Rockford Peaches oh, yeah. play the uh, Racing Bells, you know, a lot in the, a league of their own. Yeah. And uh, so I'm doing that. I, I started baking. And uh, I never baked before in all my life. I burnt the hell out of a banana bread a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but the top half was good, you know. Yeah, that's all you need. Bread. Yeah, and I made some Italian bread. My grandmother would have been very, very proud of me. But I take my walks during the day. I try to get as much information as I can about what's going on in baseball, and hopefully, we'll get back on the field here. They're trying, man. Hopefully in July, they are. They are. So we're going to see if we can do the three divisions: East, Central, West. We play everybody in the West, and uh, so have a little spring training, maybe in our, even in our home ballparks. Wow. Or possibly down in Arizona. So we just got to wait and see, but we have to stay healthy. I know. And I just want to say, uh, you know, in 45 years of broadcasting, I've seen a lot of heroes on the field, Adam, but now we got a new set of heroes, doctors, nurses who are putting their lives on the line, uh, EMTs, paramedics, folks that work in nursing homes, all our caregivers. These folks have been unbelievable doing what they're doing. We need to stay in and stay healthy so that we don't add to the, their numbers uh, so it's really incredible, and, and I want to say a big shout out to all the uh, doctors and nurses and caregivers because they have been absolute angels and heroes helping those with this coronavirus, and hopefully we can get this thing uh, corralled as best as we can and eventually a, a cure and a vaccine as soon as we can. So you and I, we can go out to a ballpark and shake hands and I love that. give our friends and loved ones a hug again and get back our normal lives. But do, our, uh, do our secret handshake, you know? Our thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you still remember it yeah it's, it always yeah. finishes with an elbow yeah, yeah you told you told me you were uh going to uh, uh, i think a hospital to drop off food um yesterday where do you do it no we went to uh four uh police precincts in uh and seattle we went to the so north cool. precinct east west south and we passed out blazing bagels uh sandwiches they had me design a sandwich last year called the rizzer i made a sandwich what? the blazing bagels what with, comes in a uh, rizzer it comes in with a salami, pepperoni, and capicola with pesto, lettuce, tomato, provolone cheese, and a pepperoni bagel. It's, uh, it's freaking I'm going to go awesome. ahead and put these Tums right here after yeah. I eat one of those. <laughs> that yeah. sounds amazing, dude. It's amazing. So we passed out 120 sandwiches to the police officers in those you. precincts. Marco Gonzalez designed a sandwich last year as well. And he went to, I think he and his wife, Monica, went to, Marco was one of our pitchers, yep. our starting pitchers, for those that don't know. Uh, kid had a hell of a year last year. 16 wins, 200 innings. Oh, man. Yeah, he's Here, prime. He's prime for a 20-win 20, oh, uh, season. I love this kid. What a yeah. great story. And uh, so he went, he and his wife, Monica, went to five uh, fire stations yesterday, and I went to four police stations. So they had uh, our uh, sandwiches. And uh, Blazing Bagels donated a dollar for every sandwich to our Toys for Kids charity, which... Uh, we buy toys for homeless kids during the uh, holiday season. That's so right. It was, it was a fun day yesterday. You're one of a kind, Rizzy. Uh, you too, buddy. I, uh, okay. All right. So let's close out here with this uh, quick 10 question okay. quarantine uh, Q&A. Um, and these don't have to be rapid fire. You give a, it can be a, a, a one word answer or it can be a couple sentence answer. So don't, don't okay. feel pressure. All right. All right. Um, first question. Uh, one thing that people don't know about Randy Johnson. That, uh, you know, he was – you know, one of the greatest competitors I ever saw. And at the end of his career, he looked back and he wished he could have done things a little differently as far as treating some of his the people in the media and things like that. Uh, he, he, he did care. 
But he went out there and he had to do it his way. He pitched with a chip on his shoulder. That's what made him so great. But uh, he, he admitted to us at the end of his career when he came to town with the Giants that he, he wished he would have maybe enjoyed it a little bit more. But he had a big heart. He cared. He really cared about one thing, and that was winning a baseball game in his night. And what he did in 1995 was absolutely remarkable. I don't think so. You know, winning so the one dominant. game playoff, starting in game three, and then coming in in game five in relief like a rock star. Uh, I will never, ever forget and appreciate what uh, Randy Johnson did for this baseball team. What sort of shampoo did he use for that mullet? Uh, I don't know that. <laughs> That's I, okay. I don't know. It would it surprise me if you did. <laughs> it, was, it was back in the day, everybody, had, Mike Lowers had a great mullet, you know? Oh, yeah. But Randy had Randy had a good one. But Randy was really he was something special. I love Randy. Uh, your favorite uh, thing about the Kingdom? Wow, my favorite thing about the Kingdom, like just the the whole the the building itself. I'm not talking like favorite yeah. moment, just favorite, you know, yeah. thing to look at from the booth. What you know, like the the turf, the the scoreboard, the fireworks after home runs. Yeah, uh, I think it was the noise in 1995. You know, the fans. You know, made that ballpark really come alive. The ball club made the kingdom come alive than the fans with the, with the noise. That's what I remember about the kingdom. You know, as you go in, it's a gray concrete dome. Dave and I used to go out on the 200 level at about three o'clock in the afternoon on a nice day, he'd smoke a heater and, and we'd look out at Mount Rainier and then we have to turn around and go back inside. But, uh, you know, we made it fun. We made it fun in the ballpark. It wasn't the greatest ballpark, obviously, in the world, but it was, it was our ballpark. You know, it was our grand old lady, and, and it was emotional when uh, it was imploded, you know, a few years after we left. And But we we now have, I think, the greatest ballpark uh, in Major League Baseball right now. But it was, I think it was the, the noise and okay. uh, the fun promotions that we had in there. Uh, that is correct. That is the correct answer. Um, <clears throat> Rizzy, show me the face you made when Adrian Beltre got hit in the nuts and got a contused testicle. Oh, I'm there scrunching everything right now. <laughs> yeah, and he the, didn't and he didn't wear a cup. Come on, you know, dude. We're taught a at a very early age in Little League oh, wear a cup, even when your he, nuts aren't even fully developed. Oh man, he got hit right in his chicken nuggets too. And it's like, <laughs> oh my goodness. And I felt it because I got hit there too. Everybody oh. played the infield, but you know, even with a cup on, it's not the greatest feeling in the world. But at least it's some sort of a wall, man. That oh yeah. And I'm thinking, oh my. <laughs> Gosh, you know, but he, he told me he felt uncomfortable with it. He couldn't play with it, but his hands were, he said, I got this on. He showed me his glove. But that one time, mm, he took a bad hop and got him right in the nards. And, uh, so, yeah, I, I, all right. Well, that, that, is, that is correct. That's the correct vase. Um, Rizzy, who would win in, a, uh, in an arm wrestling match? David Segui, Paul Sorrento, or Greg Perkel? And then in a secondary question, where is Greg Perkel? I don't know where Greg Perkle is. He was here when I was gone in Detroit. Oh, okay. But Big Perk, he was he was pretty strong. Paul Sorrento was really strong. And who was the first one? So give, uh, take me David Segui. David then Segui. Perkle's Segui out. Really Let's, Segui versus uh, Sorrento. Oh, my God. Segui was. In a pay-per-view was, match of arm uh, wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I might have to go. Well, Paulie's my buddy. I'll go with Paulie Sorrento. He's, there it he, is. To this day, he won, <laughs> he won the longest home runs I've ever seen at Old Arlington Stadium. Uh, no, at Texas Stadium, you know, the ballpark where they were in last yeah. year, previous year, since 94. He had won down the right field line between uh, the outfield bleachers onto the concourse out by the concession stands. Uh, he was a strong man. So yeah, I, I'd, a, go with, I'd go with Paulie. That is correct. Um, Riz, uh, <laughs> best ballpark snack. And we're, talking, ball cur we're talking currently. We're talking T-Mobile Park. When you're there, and obviously things have upgraded, restaurants, the food. What's your, yeah. you know, what, what, are you, what are you asking for someone to, to grab you if you did not get a, a full meal before the game starts? Uh, uh, anything from the Holy Smoke Barbecue. 
There it is. You know, oh my goodness, that that holy smoke barbecue, oh. the ribs or the brisket, is just oh, it's amazing, outstanding. Or in the the Hit It Here Cafe, they've got a, a crab sandwich that is out of this world. The pizza out in left center field. Uh, I, I can go on and on and on. The food or in, in and around the ballpark. Adam, well, I don't know what's your favorite. You you probably know better than I do because I oh I eat man. Bread bro. Well, I uh, was fortunate enough that uh, our buddy Bob Stelton took me to the um, the uh, is it called the Diamond Club? the downstairs oh the sitting behind Club. home plate yeah and going underneath uh, oh. and getting that smorgasbord of you know just oh. a buffet it's 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 not a sizzler buffet it's a no, it's major league big league. Baseball, big league I mean uh, man it was uh, I ate so much and then you get some cocktails and then you're like oh I somehow have more room for food. So then you go downstairs <laughs> and you get a little cup of some M&Ms and then you're like, well, there's popcorn here. I sh- popcorn and M&Ms are friends. I should probably put them in the same <clears> cup. <throat> and then, uh, I mean, dude, it was, that, that was, that was crazy. But there was some brisket down there one night that, that yeah. blew my mind. And also uh, Beecher's uh, macaroni and cheese. Yep. That's a home oh, run shot. That's uh, oh man, the food all over the place. And so good. It's an extra yeah. luxury that we don't, yeah. uh, we don't appreciate. All right. So what, uh, how many times have you gotten the hydroplane race right? And what color do you choose? <laughs> I'm probably uh, 50-50 on the hydroplane races. And there is wagering up in the booth, by the way. <laughs> of don't, course. Don't, don't tell the commissioner. No. <laughs> the large sums of money transfer like a dollar bill here and there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but uh, yeah, I'm right about 50% of okay, the time. Cool. Uh, is and it hat- doesn't matter the color. It doesn't. Is the hat trick rigged? <laughs> uh, I no, it's not. No, it's, it's not, not, is it, man? No, no, that's it's not rigged. These guys, you, you know. Have you met the guys that create that? Yeah, yeah. You know, they they do. Those guys do a great job. Yeah, you the in game like, entertainment. They put on a TV show every night. They do. You know? They are so talented at what they do. Like <clears> I said, <throat> the marketing guys and the folks in that Diamond Vision room and Mariners Vision room, they they really know how to entertain fans during the course of a ball game. That's always one of them. You know, yeah. you watch it. You're, you're glued to it. Find yeah. out who wins, you know. That is correct. Uh, next question, Rizzy. Uh, when the Baja men played at Safeco Field in the outfield for, I think, the whole weekend, uh, I went to all those games. How many of the lyrics of Who Let the Dogs Out did you know and sing along with? I, I None. I, all I knew was uh, Who Let the Dogs Out. Who let the dogs out? Who, 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 who? <laughs> That's only the lyrics of the song, right? <laughs> that is correct. Let the dogs out. Who? Let who? The who? Who? Yeah. Who? Who? Let the dogs out. Were there other? Were there other lyrics? To no, that no, that was it. That, that is correct. That was it. it. Yeah, correct. Answer. All right, all right, Rizzy. What? Uh, what is a more fun play to call? A bench clearing brawl or a triple play? Oh wow! Uh, I had a heck of. I felt like Howard Cosell one time. We were in Anaheim, and we had a heck of a fight. Uh, Brian Clark was pitching and pitched inside to Rod Crew, almost hit him a few times. I think he was trying to hit him. And then Crew grounded out to short, ran down the first baseline. He cut behind the mound. And uh, Clark, he said something to him. Rod said something to him. And they went at it. And there was a huge fight behind the mound. And then another fight broke out on the first base side. And then I thought it was over. And then another fight broke out. And it was just like unbelievable. I felt like. Yep. Howard Cosell doing Hot ground ball right uh, to Martinez. Frazier. Tough triple play <laughs> time. But, uh, doing Reynolds, a triple play, triple play I triple think, play, is, play, is pretty, pretty oh, special. My. You know, and I, I, and I, I, I think I'd go with uh, doing a triple play because it doesn't happen very often. Right. Yeah. That, that is the correct answer. Uh, and Riz, the uh, final, the final question. <clears throat> your uh, favorite call of yours in your uh, coming up on um, forty-five year career. Well, I, I had the pleasure of, of doing the uh, everybody scores uh, call because it happened in the seventh inning. Dave Niehaus had all those amazing, beautiful Hall of Fame calls because, you know, it, uh, the big moments happen in the ninth inning, and Dave was always there for those. So I had the privilege of doing that seventh inning call with the bases loaded, swinging a ground ball. Wait, wait, wait. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. I'm going to – I knew that you were going to say that, so – we are going to uh, pull that sucker up. No way. And ready? let you and let you do it. Here, here ready? Here we go. I'm gonna. All right. Here's screen. the pitch. 
by Langston, swing and a ground ball, sneaks on by Snow, down the right field line into the bullpen. Here comes Blowers, here comes Tino, here comes Joey. The throw home is going to be cut off by Langston. Langston's relay gets on by Allison, Cora scores. Here comes Soho, Soho scores, everybody scores. And the Mariners take a 5 to nothing lead of the ball game. Mark Langston is lying flat on his back at home plate. I really felt bad for Mark. There he is right there. And uh, Soho jumped up and uh, was getting high fives and mobbed by everybody. So that was, oh, my, that was God. my favorite call. Of course, the biggest call was Edgar's double down the right field line in game five of the division series. But that got us into the playoffs. All right. You know, now, Randy Johnson didn't win that game, and Soho doesn't get this hit. Uh, what, right before that, uh, Vince Coleman had about a 12 pitch at bat. And on the on the last pitch to Vince Coleman, it's a line drive in the right field. And Blowers, of course, is on a third. And Tim Salmon comes racing in and slides on both knees and he makes the catch. And Blowers couldn't score because he didn't know if the ball was going to drop in or if Salmon would make the catch. And he eventually made the catch. And I remember Coleman's reaction, you know, like, why didn't Mike score? But Mike couldn't score. He couldn't uh -huh. because he didn't know if his Salmon was going to catch the ball or not. So Coleman had that long at bat. Now here comes Luis, first pitch by Langston, and that's when all that happened. But it was set up by Coleman's at bat before Luis Soho got that broken bat. He broke his bat on that swing, and it got on by J.T. <clears throat> Snow at first base. And J.T. Snow was a tremendous defensive first baseman, but somehow it got on by J.T. 1995, Adam, that was our year. An amazing that, comeback. That was amazing. I can't yeah. believe you did that. That call is uh, will not be forgotten by anybody ever in the history of baseball. And, Rizzy, because you're one of my best buds and you're one of the, the best um, commentators uh, of all time, and, uh, and we're so lucky to have you in, in the city of Seattle. And because oh, I also, of course, and because I also want to do this as a kid and then uh, for whatever reason – uh, didn't, and then my dream shifted from baseball announcer to Ninja Turtle to Ice Cream Man to <laughs> comedian. So <clears throat> thankfully this stuck. But I wanted to real quick see if I could take a stab at your famous call, and if you uh, and if you could um, give me some uh, uh, if you could give me some uh, pointers, I guess. Sure. Uh, let me just take a stab, and you you tell me if um, if I'm uh, on to uh, the right uh, All track. Right. Okay, Broadcast worthy. Okay. Here we go. Give it a try, uh, buddy. Let me, let me see here. I think <clears throat> if I can do it, you can do it. I mean, that is not true at all, but all right. Am, am I sharing it? Do you see yep. it? I see it. Okay, great. So here we go. So I'm going to take a stab here. Here we go. Look, it's one to nothing. <clears throat> so this is the fan's perspective of a kid who never got to fulfill his dreams. He now is the best in the biz critiquing his skills. Here we go. You heard how it was done and how it should be done because Riz is the best in the biz. Here we go. Here's Adam Ray taking a stab at Rick Riz's famous 95 one game playoff call. And here's the pitch by Langston. Shit, he broke his bat. They've got plenty more of those. It's going to go into the bullpen. We're the, one of the only teams with the bullpen on the field. The fans are screaming obscenities. That's going to affect them. The relay. Oh, shit. Core is the man. He fell down, but it looked, turned into a slide. Soho runs like my dad, and he slides into home plate, and he's going nuts. Holy shit. Lou should be more excited, but he just claps, but he's calm and cool. Oh, man, their manager is a – he's fucking pissed. And Langston, I feel bad, but, hey, man, that's the game, baby. So he's up on his feet. The M's are going nuts, and Seattle is going to win, and I'm going to make my 20 bucks back. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so how was that? I thought it was great, but if it was on the radio, we'd have a lot of bleep. Bleep, 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 bleep. No, I thought it was yeah. outstanding. I okay. thought it was great. I think you captured the moment, you know, the excitement and everything, where the ball was. Fans could see it on the radio. I thought you were <laughs> – I the enthusiasm about, was there, right? The enthusiasm was yeah, there. Great. You, you, you I, I felt like it was at the ballpark, and I felt like I was seeing it for the first time, Adam. You were, you were fantastic. Uh, Riz, yeah. I love you so much, man. This has been a, uh, this has been. Uh, thanks for making time, and uh, like you had shit to do, but this is a really. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but this is, you know, you're, you're, you're one of a kind, man. And you are just, we're so lucky to have you. And it's, I know that you Thanks, hear that, man. but I hope you really know that because I listen to a lot of sports and a lot of uh, broadcasters and dude, you're just so damn good. And people, Thank you, buddy. you know, you, you get, I hope you feel that from, uh, from the fans as much as we feel it from you. So. Uh, no, I do. I've been very blessed, very okay, fortunate good. to be here for, 35 years, you know, and doing this as long as I have, you're looking at a guy living his dream 
So I've been very, very blessed, buddy. And I hope I can, I got another five years uh, ahead of me or maybe even more than you that. You got more than that, dude. Look, you just dropped 30 pounds, man. And you, <laughs> you <laughs> No, got, I did that a few years ago and I'm still keeping it off. You're so. keeping it off, dude. You got yeah. cookie competitions. That's not going to happen for another 25, 30 years. You forgot to ask me one more question. Please. Who's my favorite actress? Oh, Rizzy, who's your favorite actress that I'm going to make, make you meet at some point? I'm going to bridge these two together. Sandra Bullock. <laughs> Sandra Bullock is my favorite actress. She's amazing, man. I'm the Blind Side and the other 31 movies that she made, you know, Speed 1 and 2, Miss Congeniality, uh, The Bird Box, uh, The Proposal. Uh, All good. You name it, The Lake House. Uh, every, everything she's done. She's Gravity. We, we almost got her down to Anaheim, and I'm telling you, Riz, it's going to happen. So, I'm um, – that man, well, that guy. I'm a big close. fan. Tell her I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of yours too, buddy. You're so talented. Thank love you, buddy. It was I love great you too. that I had a chance to meet you at Vino Bellas and we became friends uh, because you you because you love the game of baseball. And that's what I love about my job. You know, I get a chance to go to a ballpark every day and broadcast a major league game after spending eight years in the minor leagues and uh, to meet wonderful people who share the joy of the game of baseball it brings everybody together it brings families together it brings communities together and right now we need some baseball to take our minds oh, yeah. off what we're going through right now hopefully that'll happen but i i love the game of baseball because of the people in it like yourself and so many other fans because without the fans we don't have a game you know can you I imagine know. it's going to be rough doing those ball games without any fans in the ballpark so hopefully oh. we'll find a cure for this thing a vaccine where 40,000 fans can come out to T-Mobile Park. But I, I mean, love you. I love you, too. I might be one of the last people to throw out a first pitch. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I hope, hope you have a chance to do it again. Wasn't that done. great? I had the yeah. Kneehouse jersey tribute on the back. That was awesome. I you hugged – uh, what's it? I can't remember um, – Moore. Uh, David Moore, I think, of the David catcher. Moore. Yeah. I ran up and grabbed him. You saw me do the jump kick after – Dylan Moore. Dylan, Dylan Moore. Dylan Moore. Dylan Moore to catch the pitch. Nice pitch, Adam. Nice pitch, bud. Thanks. Thanks for being with us tonight. And a big hug for Dylan Moore, too. Thanks, bud. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, Adam Ray. So I, I, you know, the fact that I got it over the plate was, I was just like, don't Mariah carry it or 50 cent it, you know? 50 cent, yeah. 50 cent, yeah. <laughs> so the fact that I got it kind of over the plate for a strike, I was going nuts and I hugged uh, Dylan and he goes, all right, man. And I wouldn't let go. And I go, I go, oh, I go, that felt so good. He goes, he goes, all right, man. He goes, you did it. And I pulled him close and I go, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you're amazing buddy you're i love so you rizzy good. keep it up and i see hope you to soon. see you real soon in oh the yeah movies. okay bud Take Bye, care, thank you bud enjoyed it okay see you bud